Distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends of the International Crisis Group, good afternoon and thank you for having joined us today. My name is Giuseppe Fama and I coordinate the European Union work for the International Crisis Group. I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to the launch of our 2021 Watchlist. This event is part of our EU Watchlist series, which is the set of activities that Crisis Group tailors to look at the role of the EU and its member states in conflict prevention, crisis management, and conflict resolution. For those who are not familiar with our EU Watchlist or even Crisis Group, let me give you a brief reminder of who we are. Crisis Group is an independent organization working to prevent wars and shape policies that can build sustained peace. Our mandate is to engage with all parties and support efforts to prevent, mitigate, and resolve deadly conflict. We do so by sounding the alarm bell, providing independent, field-based, and high-quality analysis and engaging directly with conflict actors and key international players, like many of you connected today are, to encourage informed and intelligent action for peace. So we're very glad to host this discussion with such a diverse array of participants from the EU policy world and civil society. Let me immediately acknowledge the participation of so many colleagues who are connecting with us, including uh, EU special representatives, heads of EU delegations around the globe, including from um, Tripoli, Baku and Pristina, uh, and members of the European Parliament from all political groups. They join us with plenty more colleagues from non-governmental and civil society organizations together with diplomats from your member states and many colleagues from the Commission and the External Action Service. I gather we have more than 300 registrations in this call and 200 more signed up via our YouTube live streaming. We're really humbled by your participation and sincerely thank you for uh, having made the time to be with us, especially during this uh, challenging moment. Um, and indeed it is uh, worth noting the very time we are in as this conversation takes place. First, we are not yet close to roll back the COVID pandemic. Yet as the crisis keeps dragging, the secondary impact of the pandemic becomes more evident, including in conflict. Therefore, questions on how to manage the dreary economic and humanitarian legacy of the virus have become even more evident and concerning. Second, our conversations take place uh, soon after a new administration has worn in the United States. Uh, the arrival of President Biden offers opportunities for a reset with the prospect for a return to a more multilateral diplomacy and closer cooperation with Europe. And certainly uh, uh, bringing a relief for those European leaders who had to calculate the cost uh, of potentially crossing wires with former President Trump, including for their interventions in complex situations. Uh, third, uh, 2021 marks the 10th birthday of the European External Action Service, the EU's diplomatic service, and the Commission Service for Foreign Policy Instruments, which is the main uh, conflict prevention and peace building arm in the Commission. Behind the uh, symbolic date, there is a lively debate for the EU role in peace and security matters. And in parallel, Brussels is also about to plan much of its external aid for the years to come. So today's conversations comes at a very timely moment. In this context, we look at the role of European players as they have become more relevant in the field of conflict prevention and can have a decisive role in some crisis. And the watch list 2021 that we will discuss today does that, presenting the 10 crises and conflict situations where we believe the EU and its member states can play such a positive role. Our colleagues from regional programs in the field and the staff from our policy centers put together the detailed uh, conflict analysis and recommendations targeted to EU actors in poor African conflicts namely uh, uh, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh in, in the South Caucasus, then uh, uh, Iran and the Arab Gulf, Libya, Thailand, Venezuela, and finally Mexico and uh, Central America. We will look at them during the second panel, making a deeper dive into our recommendations with our regional program directors and colleagues from the European Union. Uh, let me note that this work is possible thanks to the support of the European Commission, uh, their service for foreign policy instruments, and the very co close collaboration that we have with the European External Action Service, and particularly their uh, Integrated Security uh, and Peace uh, Directorate. Um, and this leads me to the first guest of the day, who I'm very pleased to introduce. Uh, please join me in welcoming Hilde Hardeman, the Director and Head of the European Commission Service for Foreign Policy Instruments. Uh, she heads the uh, foreign policy instruments since 2017, uh, advancing the work of more than 200 colleagues in, in Brussels and uh, European delegations around the world. 
Here they worked 25 years for the Commission on External Relations and on Economic and Market Issues, including as Deputy Head of Cabinet to the Commission Vice President and as Coordinator uh, at the presence of the Commission uh, Office for its meetings with EU heads of states and government. And finally, also as Head of EU Relations with Russia and Eastern Europe. Hilde, thank you very much for having joined us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. Um, dear friends from Crisis Group, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, it's really my pleasure to welcome you to the presentation of the Crisis Group's EU Watch List 2021. Now, this yearly event has become something we all look forward to, an invaluable opportunity to compare notes, to exchange analysis on situations in conflict or at risk of conflict, and what the EU can do to help foster peace. Today's event was one we had intended to share with Rob Mali, Crisis Group's year-long year president. But Rob moved last week from analysis to action following his appointment as US envoy for Iran. And it's excellent to see Rob, who has dedicated much of his professional life to understanding conflict dynamics and advising on how to avoid conflict or end conflict in charge of such a delicate task. Rob informed us right after his appointment, and I will be honest, however much I regret to see him go, I was delighted to get his news. So my congratulations to Rob and to Crisis Group, and I look forward to continuing the excellent cooperation with you, Richard. Very best wishes to you. And now, what brings us together today? Crisis Group's annual EU watch list. Our thanks to International Crisis Group, the colleagues in Brussels and across the world for yet another piece of top quality analysis. The Service for Foreign Policy Instruments, which I lead, and the International Crisis Group have a long-standing relationship. We have been working together since 2013, and I can honestly say that your briefings, reports, and workshops are crucial sources for our reflection and for our action. Your analysis bring out the granularities and complexities of conflict dynamics with facts and arguments, and, and that's very important, with extreme respect for the human suffering and tragedies that conflicts inevitably bring about. Conflict analysis and conflict prevention are a crucial aspect of the EU's work as a global actor. To better understand conflict dynamics, to see warning signs of potential conflict, to reflect on what to do and what not to do, and how to do what we want to do. All these steps are essential to have an impact. It's good to see how over the past years, Conflict analysis has become more and more part of the way we do business in the EU. And the work of Crisis Group has certainly contributed to making this happen. Our new instrument for international cooperation, the Neighbourhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument, that also takes over from our long-standing instrument contributing to stability and peace. Well, this new instrument gives a particular role to conflict analysis, which is now a requirement for EU programming in all fragile countries and contexts. And under our new instrument, peace building and conflict sensitivity are components of all programs, whether they're geographic and thematic. And I am sure that the work we have done with International Crisis Group in cooperation with our colleagues of the European External Action Service and the other Commission services here in Brussels and across the globe has contributed greatly to creating a culture of conflict analysis, conflict sensitivity and conflict prevention throughout the EU institutions. Now this year's EU watch list mentions old crisis and new crisis. Crisis that might be forgotten by many and crisis we consider almost on a, daily, on a daily basis. We will have the opportunity to discuss these in more detail in a moment. To conclude, let me say once more how important your work is for our action and how crucial your analysis is in building an EU response to conflict or the threat of conflict. Again, thank you. Congratulations on an excellent piece of work. 
Thank you for the excellent cooperation. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Back to you, Giuseppe. Thank you very much, Hilde, for the kind words and for your support and cooperation. Um, indeed, we share your commitment to help the EU attain, uh, as you said, a culture of conflict prevention and early action, uh, which is among our key uh, goals. Uh, and let me also pay tribute to our colleagues from the EAS uh, Integrated Security and Peace Directorate, who are also here today and with whom we also rub elbows uh, in the same effort. Uh, before leaving the virtual stage, let me acknowledge the essential contribution of, of all of crisis groups, uh, field analysts and colleagues who are behind this work, starting from our dynamic staff in Brussels, which drives our engagement with the uh, EU. And we could be no more pleased to see uh, this engagement in practice today as we uh, prepare to welcome the new uh, Secretary General of the EAS, Mr. Stefano Sannino. Uh, we're very uh, glad and honored, uh, honored to welcome uh, uh, for a conversation with our Interim uh, President uh, Richard Atwood. Uh, then uh, let me leave the floor to uh, Elisa Jobson, Crisis Group's Director for Global Advocacy, who will moderate their panel. Thank you all again for your participation. We hope that today's exchange will improve the quality of our actions and shape real impact to improve the conditions of all those affected by conflict. Um, Elisa, over to you. Uh, thanks, Giuseppe. Um, and thanks everyone joining us today, both on Zoom and live on uh, YouTube. Um, we're actually waiting uh, for one of our guests to arrive today, uh, Stefano Sanino. I don't believe he's on, on the call just yet. Um, but I'll introduce the other panellists that we have today, which is my colleague, Richard Atwood, um, who, as uh, Hilda Hardman just said is currently Crisis Group's interim president and CEO. He's just assumed this new role following the resignation of Robert Malley, who's joined the uh, Biden administration as Iran envoy. Um, Richard has been with Crisis Group for over a decade and um, was previously our chief of policy. So a warm welcome to you, uh, Richard. Um, just checking to see if Mr. Sanino is on the call yet. Um, I don't see it yet. Anyway, I'll tell you what um, what we've got planned um, in this in this first session. Um, today, we're hopefully going to be looking at global trends, conflicts, and prospects for peace um, in conversation with Mr. Sanino and Richard Atwood, um, in in which we'll touch on some of the the key issues of the day, um, particularly looking at the COVID pandemic and also um, what the new U.S. administration means for for the for the EU and also for conflict prevention and, and resolution. Um, so as I said, we're gonna start off with a short conversation between, between Mr. Sanino and Richard, and this will be followed by a QA and a in which um, I'll take questions from the floor. If you have a question, uh, please uh, write it in the Q&A facility on Zoom or in the comment box if you are joining us on YouTube. Um, please note that on Zoom, we'll be using the vote up function, uh, which allows the audience to vote for their preferred questions. Um, so there's a couple of housekeeping points that I'd also like to mention. Um, the, the event today, both panels are on the record and um, the event is being recorded. And as I said, live streamed on uh, YouTube. I have a request also, which is at the end of today's event, um, if you could kindly fill out the evaluation questionnaire that you'll receive uh, as this allows us to improve our future events. Um, just gonna check if Mr. Um, Sanino is on. He's gonna be a couple of minutes, I understand. So I'll, I'll introduce him in his absence and then um, maybe I'll uh, give uh, Richard the, the first question whilst we're waiting for Mr. Sanino. So, um, as, as, as Giuseppe said, um, we, we're, today we should have with us Stefano Sanino, uh, the Secretary General of the European External Action Service, um, a post that he's held since the start of the year. He's worked for um, 25 years in the Italian government and Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs, as well as at the EU and the um, OSCE. Before becoming Secretary General, he was the um, EAS's Deputy Secretary General for Economic and Global Affairs, covering Africa, multilateral institutions, human rights, and uh, thematic uh, issues. So, um, as I said, I think I'll start with a, a, a first question to, to, to Richard, 
um, which is uh, in, in March 2020, as COVID was um, beginning to spread quickly across the globe, a crisis group published a report analyzing the potential impact of the pandemic on conflicts and crises. We, in it, we raised the possibility of further destabilization of fragile countries, um, immense humanitarian fallout resulting from economic shutdowns and the distraction, if not paralysis of international multilateral diplomacy. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on you know, how this played out. Did, these risks don't seem to have um, been as great as we feared. And um, also what impact did the pandemic have on conflict in 2020? And how do you think its effects will be felt in 2021? Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa. And, and really, first of all, let me say really welcome to, to everyone for joining. Uh, thanks so much for, for, for joining us. I know we have, a, as you said, they said, a lot of EU officials, a lot of people from, from civil society and, and, uh, and other officials joining us. So, uh, so thank you. We really value this, this exchange. Please do feel free to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to ask questions, to post questions. And uh, we, this, is a, this is really a uh, 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 an annual event of ours that we that we look forward to, and, and, and the exchange we always find uh, find useful. So, Alyssa, I mean the, the 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 question of the international or the implications for international peace and security of the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it's a difficult question, but I think we could say we're, we're still waiting to see. In some ways, obviously, the the, the pandemic has inflicted enormous damage on millions of lives, uh, upended millions of livelihoods. It's, it's impacted so much of the world, so much of our own lives. Um, and, and it's really changed you know, a lot about the way the world worked in 2020. On the other hand, in some ways, it's, it's, it's striking that in some of the world's major conflicts, uh, the world's worst crises, it, it, it hasn't as yet really changed conflict dynamics. Um, the warring parties in some of the world's worst crises, if you look across them, many of, are, uh, of them are on the, the, the watch list. They haven't really seen reason to stop fighting each other uh, to, to fight the pandemic. And, you know, in some ways, that's not surprising. The, the, the reasons they're fighting are often quite deep seated. Some of these wars have been going on for a long time. Uh, uh, but conflict dynamics in, in some of the world's worst crises haven't really changed as, as much as might have been anticipated. And it's not that the pandemic hasn't hit some of those countries quite hard. I mean, if you think of, 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 of the way that, that COVID-19 has hit crises, for example, in, in, in Yemen, uh, in, in parts of Afghanistan and parts of Syria, uh, you know, the, the clearly people have suffered from the pandemic, but the, the fighting dynamics themselves haven't changed so much. Now, Clearly, the, the pandemic, because it's been so pervasive, it, it has played into the, 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 the context in which conflicts are taking place. So if you think, for example, of, of the, some of the decisions that governments have had to make, whether it's lockdowns, whether it's delaying elections, whether it's putting other aspects of politics on hold, these in some places have played into political instability. They've, they've changed relations between governments and opposition. You just think of one example, for example, uh, the, uh, the election delays in Ethiopia, where the, the, the government pushed back elections, understandably, because of the, the, the pandemic, that election delay was, was one of the triggers of this terrible conflict that's ongoing in Tigray that we'll talk about in the next session. But the conflict, that, the conflict in Tigray is, again, it, it's not about the government's handling of COVID. It's just that a government decision played into an existing, related to COVID, played into an existing dispute uh, between Addis Ababa and, and the uh, and the Tigray government. And so it played into the conflict dynamics, but in some ways it didn't didn't actually change them so much and certainly didn't, didn't, didn't cause the conflict. I think you could perhaps argue that with attention in Western capitals at the United Nations uh, consumed by COVID, there's been less attention to international peacemaking efforts. Uh, perhaps in some cases, leaders have seen opportunities to uh, crack down on their opponents or to pursue some of their goals with force. Uh, I think maybe that's the case in some places, but you're, you're, even there, you're, you're sort of looking at a counterfactual. You're arguing there, well, that wouldn't have happened had it not been for COVID. And I think it's sometimes quite, sometimes quite difficult to say. So I think the, the overall implications for international peace and security of the past year, you know, I think you know, we, we're still in some ways still waiting to see them. 
and it is early days. Uh, of course, the, the, the economic downturn, <coughs> the economic downturn, we know that a lot of that is still to come. Um, and we don't know yet what the implications of that will be. We put out a, 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 a conflict alert, uh, a statement today on protests in Tripoli in, in Lebanon. And these were provoked by a government lockdown. They were in response to a government lockdown, which itself was, was provoked by the pandemic. Now, of course, those come on, on top of a lot of, a lot of other grievances in, in Lebanon. Uh, the, 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 the lack of jobs, anger at elites, uh, the, 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 the Beirut explosions. But they've compounded those. They've compounded popular anger, and I think, you know, obviously the the, the Lebanon situation is is peculiar, it's particular to Lebanon. But you know, it's it's easy to see that that in countries where there's already social contracts fraying, where lifting of subsidies or lack of jobs or lack of opportunities for young people were already challenges, it's easy to see how the economic downturn is going to be tough uh, for countries like that. And I think, I mean, it's also also worth saying that the. The full political impact of the 2008 financial crisis didn't really materialize for some years. It wasn't until some years after the crisis and the response to the crisis that sort of we saw this resurgence of populism in, in, in parts of Europe, in, in the US. That took years to come. So, so I think it's fair to say that even if the international or the implications for international peace and security so far from the past year are not quite clear, you know, there's, there's a lot still to play out and, and there's a lot still to, to, to be concerned about. Uh, thanks a lot, Richard. And I see um, Mr. Sanino has, has joined, joined, joined us. Um, welcome. Um, so we, we've just been discussing um, the, uh, the impact that COVID has had on, um, on, on conflict in, in 2020 and what its impact might be in uh, 2021. Um, I'd like to ask you, Mr. San Nino, um, you know, as the EU grapples with its own internal response to COVID-19, um, how has the pandemic affected the EU's response to conflict and crises around the world? Thank you. Thank you, no, and first of all, apologies, a little bit of um, mismatch with the, uh, the um, computer and the login and the connections. Um, um, well, first of all, maybe to say that the uh, I think that the uh, the, the COVID nineteen crisis has uh, uh, generated, I would say, an acceleration of all the trends that we were already uh, looking before, um, and this unfortunately uh, um, has applied also to conflicts. In a way, I would say that. Uh, um, Contrary to what one could have expected, uh, uh, crises have gone on, um, and uh, those who were existing have become somehow even more complicated, and new ones uh, um, have started to uh, uh, to erupt. Um, the uh, difficulties that a uh, number of countries are already facing have been uh, um, worsened by uh, uh, the, the social, the um, uh, economic crisis, uh, which has aggravated the, uh, the, the situation. And so we have been uh, faced with a world uh, which was, generally speaking, uh, more difficult, more complex and uh, more fragmented than before. On the top of that, you need to add, uh, um, let's say, the attention that the uh, governments have given to the crisis. And, and so much of their energies has been devoted to, uh, uh, to management, the uh, health, and then also the economic consequences of the health crisis. And finally, I mean, the um, geopolitical situation in the last few years have generated an even uh, um, further polarization in terms of political relations. And this has been a factor that has, uh, has aggravated further the, uh, um, the situation. Um, so all in all, I would say that uh, this has been a very, uh, very difficult year um, where our that would have maybe uh, uh, that needed more of our attention and in our concentration, and on the contrary, we have been uh, uh, our attention has been diverted much more internally, and we have been much more inward looking compared with what uh, it should have been. And. Um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned there that there's, the, that there's been an, a, a more internal focus. 
Um, and you know, we're, I think we're, you know, we're looking at potentially the um, economic fallout from the pandemic, from the pandemic playing out this year and probably into the next few years. I just wondered how, if you could tell us, how is the European Union supporting fragile states um, that are facing the 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 economic fallouts of the pandemic? Well, this is, as a matter of fact, is the uh, one of the things that maybe we have managed to do in the sense that the um, um, while we were uh, um, uh, taking ourselves a sort of um, um, much more concerted approach uh, in terms of how the 27 have been able to uh, um, face the challenges of the health and of the uh, economic crisis, we have also uh, very rapidly realized that uh, uh, our, especially our neighbors, but the, uh, the, the uh, many other fragile countries in general were suffering a lot from the, from this situation and we have tried to join forces so we have come up with uh, this idea of the uh, this concept of team europe where we essentially uh, um, uh, member states uh, institutions uh, but also um, um, banks of the different uh, uh, let's say development banks of the different member states were joining uh, forces in order to make a greater impact on uh, the ground. Uh, this has allowed to uh, make a sort of a redefinition of our assistance. Um, so we have rapidly, let's say, redirected funds uh, that were uh, already been allocated for uh, uh, these countries into projects uh, that should it could support the, uh, um, uh, the, the the health situation or create fiscal space for countries to uh, face the consequences, and this has generated a quite substantial, uh, uh, let's say, uh, economic and financial impact. Um, and the other thing, which are the other initiative that we have also taken collectively, is how to. Uh, um, alleviate the burden of the external debt of uh, uh, many of many countries. Um, we have certainly managed to find an agreement on the service of the debt, but as a matter of fact, there has been also a much broader reflection on how we could come in in order to uh, um, alleviate this debt, to make it more uh, uh, manageable, more sustainable in, uh, in the future, and just to avoid that then in a six or 12 months time, um, more fragile countries could find themselves in a difficult situation. So I would say these have been the two main uh, um, fronts on which we have worked collectively. Once again, I think that, um, in a way, it's strange to uh, to put it so um, um, emphatically because it's how it should work. But uh, uh, putting together everybody and joint forces is not always an easy exercise. No, and um, you know, I, th I think you know what COVID, COVID has I think shown us. You know how how small the world is, and how important um, collective action and and um, you know co and cooperation is. I mean, I'd like to sort of shift away from um, COVID now, and you know we see an, a new um, administration in the in in the US, and you know there's lots of lots of hopes about what um, the about president what President Joe Biden can do. Um, also, I think, um, you know, I hope that the relationship between Europe and uh, America can, uh, will improve under Joe Biden. It's been tested, I think, uh, under President Trump. Um, and Europeans were very quick to signal that they wanted to rekindle the transatlantic par partnership. Um, could you tell us maybe what, what you expect this um, renewed cooperation to look like in practice? And do you think that there will be some scars um, that the EU and the US will, will find it difficult to, to heal? Thanks. Um, I hope not eh, about scars. I, mean, I hope that it's not going to be, uh, to be too complicated. At the end of the day, I think that uh, uh, the reaction uh, from uh, uh, from the European Union, from the Member State, has been very clear in terms of um, willing to re-engage very rapidly, to recommit very rapidly. Um, I, I think that, we, on the contrary, I mean, in a way, we need to manage expectations uh, because I mean, this um, uh, the change of administration does not mean that all of a sudden 
uh, we see everything uh, in eye to eye and that on everything we agree. There are areas on which there are, let's say, um, um, not long-standing disagreement. And I'm thinking in particular to the, the, the trade aspects, for example, the trade issues is always something that, uh, uh, and it is normal in a way, and between two blocks which are also competing economically, that there are frictions and tensions, uh, um, and this will remain over time. I mean, I suppose that in all, not necessarily in all foreign policy issues, we will have the same kind of approach and the same kind of, uh, of impact. But I think that one uh, uh, basic substantial uh, change is that essentially um, the, the method will be uh, an agreed method. I mean, it's not, and it's not only in, let's say, in the context of the multilateral system, which is also another important part. And I think that the first moves from the US administration have been very relevant from that point of view, re-entering the Paris Agreement, re-entering the WHO. Um, so the, uh, have been clear signals of a re-commitment, a re-engagement of the US in, uh, in the multilateral sphere, but also bilaterally, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the idea is how we can manage even to manage our disagreement which is the, uh, the, the most important thing. And that, it's, uh, and that the world hopefully uh, will not just be black and white, I mean, with me or against me. I mean, that there, there will be a space for nuances, there will be space for a different way of doing things uh, and for dialogue and for uh, um, uh, the, the possibility of understanding each other and each other's position. I think that that's the, how to say, the substantive change that uh, it's already there because this has been also the, uh, the the first all the first steps and all the first indications that have come from the uh, uh, the new administration are going in uh, in that direction. Thank you, and um, Richard, I wondered perhaps if you could um, tell us areas where where you think the EU and the US should prioritize joint action in in peace and security. Yeah, very good. I, I mean, I thought uh, I thought Mr. Sanino said it uh, said it very well. You know, in many ways, Europe has been on 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 a particularly sharp end of, of the past four years with uh, President Trump sort of openly questioning alliances, not always consulting European partners, in some ways disregarding their interests. So, you know, inevitably, there's there's there's, there's I think uh, a lot of enthusiasm in, in Europe for a new U.S. administration. And broadly speaking, lots of opportunities for for, for Europe to work together. Uh, climate crisis efforts to tackle the climate crisis is is obviously a big one. I think we'd like to see uh, Europe and the U.S. work together to try to reinvigorate the Security Council's crisis management. We detailed some of the ways that that might be that might be possible. Uh, we'd like to see the U.S. more involved again in international peacemaking, whether that's in Libya, whether it's in Yemen. A greater U.S. support behind some of the U.N.'s efforts, behind the efforts of others to to to, to end wars, to, to to mitigate some of the suffering they cause. I think we could, you know, we highlight a, a couple in our um, in our watch list. So so two in particular. Uh, obviously, one big one is is the Iran nuclear deal uh, and the relations between Europe, the U.S. Uh, and Iran, and really there the the maximum pressure strategy adopted by the Trump administration, uh, sanctions uh, moving out of the JCPOA. Uh, overall, that's, 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 been, that's been a failure. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's led Iran to accelerate its nuclear program. Uh, it's created instability across the region. It's led Iran to have more ballistic missiles, more powerful ballistic missiles. So I think we would like to see uh, you know, the, the, the US administration returns to JCPOA uh, and Europe encourage that. Uh, and then once they've gone back to the JCPOA, build on that uh, ideally in a way to, um, to, to address some of the other concerns, uh, whether it's ballistic missiles or Iran's power projection across the region. Now that's not gonna be easy. Um, the US uh, and Iran are gonna have to reach agreement on how to sequence sanctions lifting uh, with Iran's steps on, on nuclear compliance. They, they don't have long. The Iranian elections are in June and they could uh, result in a harder line president taking power. And it, even then, uh, the US is going to have to manage some of the concerns of, of Saudi Arabia, of Israel, that are worried about Iran's role in the region. 
but I think we would see a, a, a real priority for Europe in, in helping the US uh, get back to the JCPOA as, as fast as possible. And there's a number of things they could do in support of that, uh, encourage trade between Europe and Iran, uh, humanitarian support to Iran in response to the pandemic, uh, maybe also think through ways of encouraging diplomacy between Tehran and, and, and Riyadh you know, as things move forward with, with the US-Iran uh, negotiations. So that's one place. Uh, and I think the other one where there's some, some parallels is on Venezuela, where again, the US adopted this sort of maximum pressure strategy, which I think also, uh, also failed. Uh, these very tough sanctions against Venezuela, diplomatic pressure, even this abortive coup, have actually left President Maduro in a stronger position than ever. The, the strategy aimed to oust him, and he's looking, looking stronger than he's been for some time. Now, the, the, the grave humanitarian situation in Venezuela, uh, the economic collapse, that's largely on the government, I and mean, that's largely due to government mismanagement. But Maduro has been able to portray that as, as, as a result of sanctions. And some of the opposition leaders have lost support in the country because of their support of sanctions. So I think there we would look to Europe to uh, encourage the US to review its sanctions policy, uh, look at the humanitarian cost of some of the sanctions, and then collectively work out what a new approach looks like. Uh, an approach that is not necessarily rooted in backing one opposition politician, uh, and getting rid of, 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 of Maduro. Uh, but you know, what, an approach that's not so zero sum. Uh, in the end, the, the solution to the crisis in Venezuela is a credible election, which means the government's accepting reform and the opposition insisting, at least initially, that Maduro himself doesn't step down. It certainly requires working with Cuba, Russia, and, and China. So I think there, there are opportunities to work with the US for, for a fresh approach. I think broadly, as, as, as Mr. Sanino said, broadly the challenge with the US will be working as much as possible together, uh, but also for Europe moving its, its own discussions of strategic autonomy forward. Mm. Obviously, President Biden won resoundingly, uh, but still many people voted for Trump. Uh, still, there's a big constituency that supports at least some of what President Trump stood for. Uh, it's easily possible that in four years time, somebody like him, somebody skeptical about alliances, somebody skeptical about the relationship with Europe, somebody skeptical about multilateralism, it's easily possible that in four years time, someone like him will come back. And the challenge, the, I think the overarching challenge for, for, for Europe will be to work as much as possible with the Biden administration over these four years, while still preparing for that eventuality. Thanks, Richard. And just to sort of follow up on that, I mean, uh, obviously the, the images of the uh, assault on the US Capitol um, were received with shock and dismay around the world. And, um, you know, I think President Trump, Trump's attempt to overturn the election results were straight out of the autocrats playbook. And, um, you know, get, given this and given that many conflicts and crises around the world originate from election and military um, election disputes and also military coups like the one we've just seen uh, this week in, in Myanmar, um, you know, what, what did the events that played out in DC earlier this year mean for US credibility in international uh, crisis diplomacy and also uh, intervention in, in conflict. And do you think this opens up space for other actors like the EU? Look, and, uh, I... <laughs> sorry, Mr. Sinem, please go ahead. No, 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 sorry. It's the, uh, who, um, you start and then I can continue, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. And now I'm interested in your response. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, then I'll, I'll move. I'll move forward. I'll, I'll do. I think that uh, first of all, um, let me um, go back to one of the things that Richard was saying, uh, and I think that it's very, uh, um, um, it's very relevant about the, uh, the strategic autonomy because I think it's something that it, um, it's relevant in the debate within the European Union, but it's relevant also in our in our discussion. With the, uh, uh, with the new administration and where I think we need to work very rapidly uh, um, together. Um, the idea is really, um, and now I don't want to say because you know, we can have a different kind of administration tomorrow, but I think that in a partnership, uh, especially in a, in a strong partnership, in a privileged partnership, like one that we have between the European Union and the United States, it is essential that the two sides are equally strong. 
that it's a strong partnership does not mean one strong partner and a weak one. Um, a strong partnership means that the two can, let's say, intervene credibly in, uh, in different areas, in different sectors. I think that, I'll say, in a way, the debate has been charged a little bit too much emotionally and I would say um, ideologically. And once again, it's in, in this sort of uh, uh, black and white. So, I mean, you can, if you are my partner, then you have to say whatever I say or whatever I do. Um, uh, that's not the point. The point is how we can manage when we are facing crisis, when we are facing difficult situation, how we can manage to uh, bring our way together in order to get a change. And I think that Richard was very right when he was speaking about a number of crises. The crises are not solved only by putting maximum pressure, right? because at the end of the day, if I want to go to the end of my uh, line of reasoning and maybe going too far, the only thing that you can do then is get a military intervention. Uh, it's the uh, because then if you the max that's the maximum pressure that you can put. But we cannot, I would say, go everywhere in the world militarily. So I mean, in a way, uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, engage uh, the parties to find solutions into the area of what can be done together. Huh? The world is complex and needs to be managed, and that's the uh, the, uh, the the complexity of the work that, that we are all doing. So, I mean, strong partnership means also this. And the European Union has tried to develop, I would say, its, in, uh, its raison d'etre, right? the fact itself of being uh, ourselves is the fact of becoming stronger, of becoming more credible, of becoming more able to uh, uh, intervene. I don't think that nobody was uh, uh, saying having problems in uh, uh, the, United, the European Union becoming a stronger commercial partner when we were developing our uh, commercial policy or when we were developing our euro. And the euro is certainly a very important sign of strategic autonomy from, from many points of view. And I, I could continue, eh? and there are, there are so many examples and so many areas in which we are working in order simply to, let's say, become less fragile, less exposed, because being together and pulling together our forces and our energies as uh, member states of the European Union, we can be stronger in, uh, on the international scene. So, I mean, for me, it's not that uh, if because the United States have had the problem during a period, this is opening a space for the European Union. Uh, honestly, it's not the approach that we should take. I mean, uh, um, um, I'm not glad. I'm not happy when I saw what I saw uh, happening in the capital. I was not rejoined uh, of this. On the contrary, I was very saddened. And my reflection uh, the, 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 the morning after was that I felt that we were all more fragile, more exposed, somehow um, less strong collectively. And that's the point, the point that we, we, we need to, uh, I think that we need to assume, and I hope that we, uh, we assume, is that if both we are st stronger, it's much better. So it's not that weakness of the other of the, is a, uh, makes our life easier for, uh, uh, for the other side. So I want a strong United States, I want a strong Europe, I want a very strong partnership between the two, and us together being able to influence more process in the world, exactly because in a way we share the same vision, we have the same, uh, I know that the word is abused, but the same set of values, and I mean, uh, we are open societies, uh, um, democracies, uh, we believe in a number of, uh, believe in human rights and in, uh, in, uh, in the divisibility of the human rights, and that's what we are trying to uh, um, affirm in the world. I, 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 mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, Stefano said it very well. I mean, I, I agree with that com completely. I mean, if you, I think if you look at the, the, the crises on our, on our list for the EU, it's clear how much stronger uh, efforts to end them are when Europe and the US can work together. Uh, that, that, that's clear. I mean, that's, it's, it's a force multiplier. I mean, that's, that, that, that's clearly the case. Um, I, I think the, 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 the difficulty, of course, is that now that for the next four years, there will be this opportunity and Europe should do what it can to work with the Biden administration, but it also needs to prepare for a time when, when the, again, there might be a, a, a US administration that, that, is, that, is, that is less uh, outward facing, that is less supportive of working together to end conflicts. You know, and I think then it's not so much that there are opportunities for the European Union. 
I think then there will be a, a greater necessity for, for, for Europe, as there has been over the past few years, to, to step in. And, and you know, we've seen Europe in a number of places try to, to, to step in where, where the, the uh, policies of the US administration haven't been, been helpful, whether this is on trying to keep the JCPOA, JCPOA alive, whether it's been trying to keep uh, you know, humanitarian support going to the Palestinians. So, so, so a whole number of places where, where Europe has sort of been forced to step up over the past, past few years. I think your question on whether the, uh, the assault on the capital undercut US credibility in, in conflict prevention, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question. Of course, it's not just the assault on the capital, it's also some of the other things that President Trump did when he was in office, is sort of questioning of democratic institutions. You know, I don't think people expect across the world for the US to be you know, entirely consistent in its promotional values. But it is quite different to have someone in the White House who's sort of openly admiring the powers that dictators across the world enjoy. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think he was he was clearly a departure, and you know, in some ways, he's he's um, he's he's done some damage to to U.S. credibility. Uh, the fact that the institutions in the U.S. survived, uh, you know, quite a vigorous assault by him and his team against them, I think, shows to some degree their their, their resilience. But obviously, you know, some of the things he did is, is uh, are damaging to to U.S. credibility. I would say. You know, I, I think the link between U.S. credibility and conflict prevention is, is sometimes quite, quite, quite a difficult one. Um, you know, in, in the end, if the U.S. wants to make something happen, working with Europe, working with others, if it wants to persuade an ally to do something, uh, persuade an ally to release political prisoners or not beat up on the opposition or, you know, to, to, to curb its nuclear program or other things, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's credibility matters, but it also matters how much energy it's prepared to put into doing that, how much political capital it's prepared to invest in doing that. So power in some ways is, and, and power and, and, and how much of a political priority something is, it, it can be as important as, 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 as credibility. I think I'd also say that you know, where US credibility already over the last, you know, clearly the US is absolutely essential. The more that Europe and Europe, the US can work together on conflict management, the better. I would say that, you know, in some ways, uh, US credibility in conflict prevention has taken, you know, taken some hits since, uh, since the, uh, over the past couple of decades. Obviously, there's the wars in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq. There's what happened in, in South Sudan to some degree in Libya, in Syria. You know, in some ways, Trump sounded very different, and he's done some things very, very different, differently. Stepping out of deals, stepping out of international commitments. Of course, this is terrible for U.S. credibility. But in other ways, um, you know, I think, I think, uh, in some ways, in parts of the world, U.S. credibility was already uh, er eroding, and in some ways, Trump was uh, President Trump was a continuation of trends that were that were already uh, already underway. Uh, thanks, Richard. So we've, we've got a few questions now that have, that have come in um, from, from the audience. And as I said um, before, if you, if you do have a question, uh, if you're on Zoom, please do type it into the Q&A. Um, and we're um, exercising uh, democracy here by having the vote up function. And, um, you know, the, the most popular questions will get answered. Um, and also, uh, for anyone on YouTube, if you do have a question, please please put that in the um, uh, in the comment section, and, and we'll do our best to get to it. So the, the first question that we've got here is from Eric Kurtz from the German Council on Foreign Relations, and um, he says that given the coup in Myanmar, what lessons do can we draw for for European support to um, democratic transition processes such as in Myanmar, Myanmar but also uh, Ethiopia or Sudan. Um, so maybe I'll ask you to answer that one Mr Zanino first. So what lessons do you draw for European support to dem democratic transition processes such as those in uh, Myanmar given the coup? Thanks. Well I mean unfortunately the lesson is that democratic transition is uh, uh, is a fragile uh, process that uh, uh, needs to be nurtured and that I mean, not necessarily is a linear one and you may have uh, a back and forth. Um, I think that uh, um, collectively, I'm not speaking about the European Union, we have been very supportive on the, uh, for the transition in, uh, in, in Myanmar. 
try to uh, uh, be there to uh, um, say provide um, uh, support to the, uh, to the economy, to the civil society, uh, to the political environment, uh, with all the limits also that um, this was having. But the, uh, uh, the result is that, um, again, it's, uh, the fragility is still there. And, in, uh, and we have not managed to, uh, um, uh, to have a, uh, the capacity in the country itself, not have the capacity to uh, uh, strengthen uh, uh, its democratic um, uh, institutions. That said, there are some positive elements which I think are, uh, are important to, uh, to underline. The uh, level of participation in the elections uh, um, is very high, 70%. It's something that essentially is... Uh, a positive indication of the willingness of the population to uh, uh, be part of, uh, of this process. Um, we do not know uh, uh, which will be the uh, capacity to, uh, uh, let's say, re internal reaction uh, from, uh, from Myanmar. Uh, I think that there has been a very, uh, at least from on our side, on the side of the uh, United States, but also on Japan, very clear condemnation for what has been considered a, um, a coup. And uh, um, this is also an element that we uh, need to, uh, um, uh, to, work, to work on and to build upon. Now, the question is how can we manage to, uh, uh, and still insisting on uh, uh, the authorities to, uh, to go back on the, and to go back to a more constructive, uh, um, constructive track. Um, that said, again, I mean, there are uh, the element that also we need to take into account is the fact that society themselves needs to develop the capacity to, uh, uh, to react and to find uh, um, solutions that are internal within uh, their, own their own societies. We can be supportive, we can, uh, uh, let's say, from outside provide uh, um, financial assistance or other kind of assistance in order to help uh, the development, but the, um, the solutions have to come from inside. So, Richard, did you have anything to add? No, I think that's, that's, that's right. Perhaps I would add that, you know, clearly what's important now is that, that international actors speak with a, a, as united a, a voice as possible in urging the, the restoration of, of, of civilian rule. Ideally, the, the Myanmar military will, will reverse course. The other, the other priority, of course, is that this is likely to, to, to fuel popular discontent in, in, in Myanmar. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi had lost some of the, the, the reputation she, she had outside the country because of her, uh, her, her lack of defense of, of the Rohingya, but she remains enormously popular in the country. Uh, and, and it's easily possible that, that uh, this popular discontent will, will manifest itself in street protests, that people will take to the streets. And then, of course, there's a, there's, there's a danger of, of, sort of violent crackdowns by the military. And I think at the same time as urging for the restoration of, of civilian rule, it's also important that, uh, that um, you know, that international actors, that those with influence on, on, uh, on the uh, Myanmar military, uh, urge them not to, uh, you know, to act with maximum restraint, to not crack down on protesters if they do gather. Thanks. Um, we've, we've got a very popular question for Mr. Sanino um, from Anna Penfrat uh, from the European Peacebuilding Liaison Office. Thanks, um, Anna. She would like to know, uh, would it be possible for you to share um, your priorities as new Secretary General of the um, EAS and uh, to continue, to, how are you going to continue to improve the EU's contributions to conflict prevention and peace building efforts? So it'd be good to get your, your thoughts on that, Mr. Sanino. Um, I don't know if it's going to be popular, my reply, but I mean, essentially, uh, for me, the, uh, uh, the main priority that I see is how I can enhance the uh, um, effectiveness of the uh, response of the European Union when it comes to the, uh, um, the area of the uh, external relations. And that implies essentially a, a very uh, uh, strong work that, and very intense work that needs to be done with the, um, um, our stakeholders, uh, with them, uh, uh, the member states, uh, the commission, uh, 
civil society uh, in order to uh, bring together all these elements to make our um, action more effective and coherent. So I won't, uh, I won't dwell on priorities and themes, but on methods. And that's the, um, uh, because if we can manage to get the methodology right, then we can do a lot of things. Otherwise, if I'm uh, focusing only on one or two priorities, maybe I can get one, but I will lose 10. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we've got up, and it's probably going to be our last one, I think, because we're running out of time, um, is from Paul Nolan at the European Institute of Peace. Um, he says that climate change was number 10 on another of crisis groups lists, um, our 10 conflicts to watch, which we put out uh, with foreign policy. And um, it states that in, that in that piece, we state that without urgent action, the danger of climate-related um, conflict will rise in the years ahead. Uh, the, so his question, uh, Paul's question is, how is the um, EEAS adapting to this worsening situation? So Mr. Sanino, if you'd like to answer that. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, uh, uh, and that goes a little bit with the, in line with what I was saying before, in the sense that the, uh, for me, the, uh, uh, the big question is how we can become uh, more effective in areas of foreign policy or of crisis uh, in, uh, in that are not the traditional geographic crisis, but they are going beyond, beyond this. Uh, if you want the uh, uh, the climate, the green uh, uh, challenge, as the uh, the digital challenge or the migration challenge, have become let's say uh, uh, very key aspects of uh, of our agenda. That does not mean that crisis management is less relevant. Crisis management continues to be an important part of, uh, of of the story and continues to be an important part of our activity. But we are relatively more equipped for uh, uh, this kind of, of action, which is more traditional. Now, the point is how we become uh, op operational and, and effective in these other areas, because more and more we are witnessing a sort of weaponization of these policies. And, uh, um, and this can, uh, can be game changer from, uh, from many points of view. That's why I think that it is important that we focus now on how we uh, can uh, enhance our effectiveness in, in, uh, um, in all these areas. Um, we, uh, we need to um, maybe to rethink uh, um, the way we work. We need maybe to rethink our, uh, um, uh, the way we are structured. Uh, this is a process that I've already started doing with, uh, with my colleagues here in the, uh, in the IS but on which then we need also to go more public in order to uh, redefine the way uh, we work. But we need certainly to overcome the traditional crisis management approach. Um, Richard, I don't know if you have any particular thoughts on, on climate change, especially you know, as it relates to what we, what we wrote in the, um, the 10 conflicts to watch. Oh, just, just very quickly, because I realize we don't have much time. And uh, you know, I think, uh, Obviously, the, the, as, as we wrote in the 10 conflicts to watch, we see climate change, uh, although the relationship between global warming, between changing weather and conflict is complex, uh, and it, it, it varies by country, it varies how, uh, by how governments are able to deal with it. Clearly, the, the, the changes in temperature, the changes in weather patterns are in parts of the world fueling uh, instability and aggravating risks that were already there. I think for us, the important thing is not only that, that, that Europe does everything it can to, to address the challenge, the broader, cha the broader climate crisis, but some of the, the, the money that northern governments have promised to the global south, some of the countries that are really on the front line of this, that this materializes that countries that are uh, what countries that are particularly vulnerable to instability caused by changing weather patterns that they have the support they need to help mitigate some of the risks to help adapt to some of the risks to help manage some of the tensions that this this causes and maybe just maybe like let, let let me make one broader point about uh, about efforts to uh, tackle the climate crisis and work with other countries on the climate crisis we um we published a piece uh, some months ago looking at relations between Russia and Turkey. 
And it's, I think it was interesting in a few ways. First, because both Russia and Turkey are so active in, in war making and in peacemaking across parts of the world at a time when uh, Western powers are, are, are less involved. But it's also interesting, I think, because Moscow and Ankara back opposing sides on, in many different conflicts. Uh, their allies fight it out on many different battlefields, but they're able to comp compartmentalize. They're able to put their disputes, whether it's in Syria or in Libya, or even to some degree in the South Caucasus to one side and cooperate in other areas. Uh, in, in, in many ways, they're, they're, they're quite close allies, even as they're fighting on opposite sides of other wars. And it seems that, that climate change, and like many of, like many of the issues that, that Europe is dealing with, also requires this sort of approach. Not that Europe should draw lessons from Russia and Turkey more broadly, but it, it lessens in the way that they compartmentalize, that they're able to put differences on some issues to one side, even as they cooperate on others. Mm -hmm. This is, for me, this is a, in some ways a, a, a really a symptom of geopolitics today, and it, particularly in the dilemma that the, that the European Union and Europe finds itself. It's gonna to have to disagree with China on many things, whether it's trade practices, working with the US to, to, to look at Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea, some of the things it does at home, but at the same time work with China where that's possible, including particularly on climate change, uh, on peacekeeping in Africa might be another issue. In much the same way Russia, there's a lot to disagree with Russia about, and there's a lot to coordinate with the US on, 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 its, on Europe's approach to Russia, but there are places where Europe needs to work with Russia. Again, climate change is a big one, Working on the South Caucasus might be might be another one, and even with a close ally with like the U.S., there's going to be areas where the U.S. where Europe agrees and areas where it disagrees. And I think whether the world can tackle the climate crisis, but also what international efforts to look to tackle some of the other crises that conflict that crisis group is dealing with, some of the crises uh, on our watch list, what those efforts look like will really hinge on whether major and regional powers can, again, disagree and compete in some areas while putting those disagreements aside to work together on others. Can I say that I um, share this point of view 100%? I think that it's, uh, it's really the, uh, the, uh, a, very, um, a very relevant point that, uh, that you have made, Richard. And uh, this is the, um, uh, that's why I mean, we need to change our approach. We need to change the way we work. We need to change, how to say, the mentality of how we deal uh, with a number of countries, how we deal with crisis, because we need to adjust to, the, to this situation. And it is interesting uh, um, uh, that the um, uh, foreign ministers are more and more entering into uh, uh, this kind of, uh, um, of uh, let's say, uh, dimension. Eh? Uh, more and more you see uh, them discussing uh, um, uh, climate change, you see them discussing migration, you see them discussing uh, you know, uh, digital, just to uh, mention again the, uh, the, the big files that we have opened and how you uh, in in all these areas you need to uh, uh, to define with whom you work how to define partnerships and what it is important and that's why i go back to the point of the multilateralism as a, an important framework because what it is important is that you have a framework within which you can even uh, uh, work on your disagreements and you have a sort of uh, Common, common rules, or at least, let's say, uh, commonly accepted rules that can uh, help to manage this disagreement. I think that it's, uh, I'll say it's a little bit, it's nice, and I mean, uh, I, ideally, we should all have a world of uh, um, um, peace and uh, prosperity and, uh, and uh, um, uh, universal love, but at the end of the day, Lacking this, we need a world where we have rules where we can manage our disagreement. Okay. Well, um, I think peace, prosperity, and uh, and love are good points to leave the discussion on. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to answer all the questions that came through, but I'd really like to thank um, Mr. Sinino uh, and also Richard for the um, rich discussion that we've just had. So I'm going to hand over to, um, to Richard now, because um, he's going to be moderating the next session. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much, Elisa. And really, thank you, uh, Stefano, for, for, for joining us. So yeah. we're going to go straight into the, uh, into the next session, uh, where we're going to have the opportunity to look in more depth, depth at some of the crises uh, on our watch list uh, this, uh, this year.
So I'm delighted uh, for this second panel to be joined by a number of my uh, crisis group colleagues and two colleagues from the, from the EU institutions. Uh, in alphabetical order, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, I'm joined by Ivan Briscoe, who is Crisis Group's Latin America uh, and Caribbean Program Director. I'm joined by Comfort Iro, who is Crisis Group's long-serving uh, Africa Director. Uh, but since Rob Malley uh, left Crisis Group, uh, which Alyssa talked about at the beginning, uh, I'm delighted that Comfort has uh, stepped up into the role of, uh, of Interim Vice President. So Comfort Iro. Crisis Group's Interim Vice President is also on the panel. Uh, Mark uh, Friedrich, uh, who is the Deputy Director of the Foreign Policy Instruments from the European Commission, uh, is also on the panel. Mark, welcome. Uh, Joost Hilterman, Crisis Group's Middle East North Africa Director. Olya Olika, uh, our Europe and Central Asia Program Director. And uh, René Van Ness, who's the uh, Head of Division for the Integrated Approach for Security and Peace uh, in the External Action Service. René isn't here yet, but uh, he will also join us. So I think you should have, most of you would have heard um, Alyssa run through some of the ground rules, but let me just run through them very, very quickly again for people that have just joined. Uh, the event's on the record. Uh, it's live streamed on YouTube. Um, we've got I think more than 300 uh, registered participants, EU policymakers, member state diplomats uh, from Brussels, from capitals, uh, civil society, uh, representatives of think tanks in Europe, really a great, uh, great uh, level of participation. Um, so I'm going to try to, over the next, uh, over the next uh, uh, hour and a half or so, steer a conversation through uh, some of the crises uh, on our watch list uh, with our program directors and, and, uh, and our two uh, senior EU officials. We'll try to mention most of the crises on the watch list. If we don't mention one that you would like to hear about, please feel free to raise a question. Um, I think, uh, but uh, Lavinia or uh, someone else who's, who's online can confirm, I think we would like you to uh, put your questions in the, in the chat uh, and, and we'll take those as, as, as they come and as the conversation allows. So what I thought we'd do is start comfort with uh, you to talk about a, a war that I think is, is, is really on, on a lot of our minds at the moment. Um, uh, and that's the conflict in, in Ethiopia's Northern Tigray region. Obviously it's a, it's, it's, it's a hugely important uh, region and a hugely important country. I mean, Ethiopia, pivotal, really a pivotal country uh, in the Horn of Africa. And there's, you know, there's the, already the war has killed thousands of people, displaced many and, uh, reportedly this very, very serious humanitarian situation in, in parts of the Tigray region. So Comfort, could I ask you to, to talk a little bit about how things look in Tigray and, and in particular to focus on what, what Europe should do, what the European Union should do to, to, to both help end the conflict and ease some of its, uh, its terrible human cost. Um, thank you very much, Richard, and really um, nice to be on this panel with um, um, EU colleagues as well. Um, so, Richard, I mean, you started to, to provide that grim humanitarian picture. I mean, there's no good news um, coming out of Tigray at the moment. The humanitarian figures are, are pretty grim. The war has killed um, thousands, um, forced an estimated 50,000 into neighbouring Sudan, which is already volatile and going through a very shaky transition of its own. Um, within Ethiopia itself, um, two million displaced um, people who are bereft from food and shelter. Um, in addition to that, um, daily reports um, from, um, from various humanitarian agencies and others who are able to get some kind of access. Um, and those who are reporting from within Ethiopia talk of widespread ethnic um, targeting, um, killings, massive looting, rapes, forceful, forceful return of refugees, and possible war crimes as well. And also evidence is coming through um, of looting um, by Eritrean forces as well. So the, the, the humanitarian situation, Richard, before, we, before the war was pretty precarious, and now it it's really has, has deteriorated um, in the last few months as well. Um, huge parts of, of Tigray, as you know, is still at war. Um, we still got, you know, we've got a very strong resistance, a popular resistance 
um, by determined groups and the civilian um, support taking place as well. The government is, is blaming the Tigrayan for the worst in situation. And yes, while there's been significant sort of damage on the by the Tigrayan side, the government is also in denial about its own role. So that's just a very quick picture of the humanitarian situation. Um, in terms of what the, the EU um, can do, this is a very good, good timing for us to be having um, this conversation because this month, later this month, um, the EU will, will, will dispatch um, its humanitarian um, negotiator um, to Ethiopia, the, 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 the foreign minister um, for Finland, um, um, Pekka um, Havisto, will be going to, to Addis Ababa. And the, the EU has taken two important steps um, already, which I think is worth highlighting. Um, first um, was the, the decision to suspend um, budget support up, up to eight, um, 88 um, and a half million um, euros. And tied to that, the, in, in re, to, re, to return to, um, or to get um, full budget um, support back on stream, the EU, I mean, I think has, has set out um, a list of important conditions, which we welcome and which we see as crucial to changing the humanitarian situation on the ground. I mean, crucially, um, the EU has taken a front um, leadership in asking for um, um, widespread unfettered humanitarian access along with the UN um, to ensure that um, all aid agencies um, can reach um, the affected areas. I think this is an important um, um, step. Um, also an important step is to ensure the security of all refugees um, um, in various camps. And as one of the concerns that we heard at the height of the conflict was the, the insecurity and vulnerability of refugees in those various camps as well. I think it was also important that the, that the EU in outlined it in its own conditions was to press home the issue about stopping ethnic targeting and hate speech as well, which is a very worrying development in this crisis as well. One area that I think we were very concerned about was in terms of the human, humanitarian, um, the human rights violations. Um, the Ethiopia has its own human rights um, commission that is headed by um, a very prominent, well-respected um, human rights um, activist. And that, um, that body can play a very central role in terms of monitoring the human rights violations um, in the country. And, it's, and it would have legitimacy in being a homegrown initiative. So I think tied to that EU condition is just to emphasize the role that a homegrown body can already play in terms of ensuring human, um, independent verification of crimes that have been committed in the, in the Tigray as well. I'd also say tied to that, um, Richard, a point that we have emphasized um, is the reestablishment of communications, uh, media access, but also that the government um, has to find a way in which to tolerate dissent and also to tolerate um, the possibility of journalists to be able to go um, to degrade to also um, ensure that there's um, full understanding of the conflict, but also to help pull away from this counterproductive blame and counter counter um, counter um, blame that you're seeing from both the Tigrayan um, and the, the government side as well. I mean, these are these are crucial conditions that the EU has put on the table. And we would, we would urge the, the, the EU, especially as its envoy now goes into Addis Ababa to, to, to maintain this principled stance that it's already put together. It's a very good one. Um, we've em emphasized that it, that it should be backed by all other international actors, the UN and particularly um, Ethiopia's international allies. Of course, as you know, Richard, this is a very delicate dance for the European Union, um, which sees Ethiopia as a crucial political partner, sees Ethiopia as an important anchor state in the region. But it's very important that if we're going to um, roll back on the grim humanitarian situation, that there has to be some hard talk um, on, the, on the political gains that are necessary for Ethiopia if we're going to change the, the humanitarian dynamics that, that are worsening um, by the day. On top of that, Richard, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll stop here and we can come back um, for other issues. On top of the Tigrayan crisis, you, all that, you have other crises um, bubbling away in the country that also complicate the humanitarian picture. So if we don't begin to arrest the tide of these crises, we're going to see a further slide and deterioration in the, good, in, in the country. So this is a good time on the eve of the envoy going into Ethiopia for us to have this candid conversation about how to support these conditions that the EU has already laid down on, on the table. 
Thank you very much, Kampa. It's a really uh, a very worrying picture, but I think very clear guidance and, and, and support for the for the position so far that the, 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 that the European Union, that Brussels has, has taken. Mark, could I ask you to, to, to come in and Kampa to outline some of the things that we we appreciate that the EU is doing, some of the things that we would like it to, to, to build on its current approach uh, and do. Would you like to, to, to come in on anything that Kampa said? Sure, thanks very much, Richard. And let me first of all start by uh, congratulating both um, you and Comfort uh, and also International Crisis Group overall over um, the, the recent appointment of, of, of Rob and um, the prominence that, that you have gained um, through that, but also more so still through, through the work that, that you have been doing for us, uh, for us and for the world. Um, very briefly on, on what Comfort has already outlined in, in a very clear way. Um, obviously, I won't speak too much about, about the humanitarian assistance um, where DG Echo uh, is clearly in the lead. Um, the, the, the mission, uh, the upcoming mission of the um, uh, Finnish Prime Minister has been mentioned. Um, the, the, the Commissioner Lenarczyk has, has recently been Indeed, as Comfort was outlining, there is the issue at the moment is not so much the mobilization of, of the actors or of the funds, it is the access uh, and the need for uh, the, the Ethiopian authorities to provide that access. Um, and that is where um, I think the leverage of the current EU discussions are, are, are certainly, um, is, is certainly focusing. Um, to try and see that uh, jointly with our multilateral partners, uh, uh, we, we maintain a, a firm position and do not provide legitimacy uh, to uh, a covering up of um, uh, the, the violence that has occurred. Now, Comfort also mentioned the, the importance of following up on, on some of the allegations about human rights violations. Um, the, the, the deteriorating human rights situation in the country, not only in Tigray, but, but also in other parts, is, is certainly a key risk factor for, for future instability. And that is something that, that we in, in the Service of Foreign Policy Instruments jointly with, with the colleagues at the EES are extremely concerned about and are looking into. Um, and where um, the, the EU is already providing uh, support to the Ethiopian uh, Human Rights Commission um, and, and we are currently looking at beefing that up to make sure that, that, that the investigative capacities um, match indeed the needs that are currently there um, and will also there indeed look to work closely uh, with, with the UN on that. Um, I think there was a question previously in the, in the panel about, to the panel about how um, you know, how we, we consider uh, democracy support in, in, in view of recent events. Uh, the, the example that was mentioned was Myanmar, but also Ethiopia. And I think it's, it's simply very clear that I th when, when in Ethiopia the, the transition started, um, the risks that it entailed, um, I think, were quite obvious. Maybe we didn't see at the time uh, that it would pan out in this way. Uh, but I think it, it was, it's been obvious over the last few years that there is an, an imminent risk at, at very many different, um, in very many different parts of the country, in different parts of society. Uh, and this is something that um, we have been trying to address um, by working both with, uh, you know, shaping up the, the, the capacities of political parties to um, to, to undertake uh, democratic pluralistic discussions, but also working with uh, electoral authorities and, and organizations working in this field to try and make um, the, the elections more uh, secure in future. So that's, I think, what I would want to add to what Comfort has already outlined. I'll leave it here. Back to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Mark. And, and, and I should add that the Obviously, what's happened in Tigray was, to some degree, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's it's it's, uh, it's been a, a a real blow to the transition under Prime Minister Abiy. But the crisis group has been very supportive of that transition uh, since uh, Prime Minister Abiy uh, assumed power. But we've also warned early. Comfort and her team have been really at the forefront of warning of some of the dangers in the transition, some of the forces, the ethno-nationalist forces that it that it that it that it, uh, that it unlocked. Um, 
Rene, could I turn to you to reflect a little bit on the uh, the role of the External Action Service in Ethiopia? Yeah, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Richard, uh, and it's great to be uh, it's great to be with you today. Um, as this is the first time that I uh, am able to take the floor, uh, let me thank uh, ICG for for organizing this uh, panel, for organizing many other. Uh, opportunities to, to 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 discuss with you, to exchange with your researchers. Uh, you're really a, a, a value to uh, to us and and to the work that we do. So really, most appreciated, and and I look forward to to continuing that um, that uh, collaboration with you. Um, Ethiopia is really close to my heart. Uh, I've, I, I lived there for four years, um, and and it's a country that that once you have lived there will never leave you, as it is indeed such a special place. Uh, so terrible to see uh, this uh, situation now. Uh, I think Ethiopia made great strides, um, actually made an enormous uh, development over the last uh, decade uh, with the uh, economic growth figures that would make any government in the world too jealous. Uh, and to see this now is, is just absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, so uh, as Comfort explained, situation in Ethiopia, extremely worrisome, uh, very difficult, uh, difficult, also to to difficult to help, difficult to find access points, difficult to find entry points to to start to to engage. Uh, you basically need two hands to clap, and uh, it's not always easy in in Ethiopia to to find these entry points to um, to 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 have that engagement uh, to to really. Um, start to do something useful in terms of, of, of dialogue support or, or indeed uh, if you take that further mediation. Um, you know, you've seen all the, the formal expressions of our concern, call for immediate cessation of hostilities and for the resolution of political disputes. Um, all of that we, 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 we have done and it is important uh, that, that we have done that so quickly and so, so, so outspoken. Uh, and of course, in full coordination with the uh, African Union and the UN. Um, Comfort mentioned it already. I, I just want to mention it very briefly because it is quite special and it's not entirely the, the EAS responsibility. And I hope my colleagues from the, uh, from the Commission will, will uh, uh, allow me to mention this again. Um, stopping something like budget support is a big thing for, for, for the EU. Um, but as, as explained by both uh, Commissioner Urpilainen and um, uh, High Representative Borrell, um, yes, Ethiopia will always remain a very important partner in the Horn, but we cannot accept the current situation and therefore we did stop the delivering of this budget support. So for those of you who do not know what budget support is, that is basically a transfer directly into the treasury of a country. Um, and I think that is the, the, the conversation that you need to have with your partners and say, okay, I, here you, you have crossed the number of principles. These are my conditions. Uh, humanitarian access, protection of civilians, investigation of human rights and atrocities, and indeed, as as uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, access to media, especially in Tigai. Uh, so, so this is really part of the political engagement that we have with uh, with the Ethiopians. Clear that that Mark, as Mark said, you know, it's it's, and I think you said it as well, uh, Richard. It doesn't come as a full surprise uh, if, if you have such a strong ethnic federalist policy and you basically abandon that, you need to replace it with something else, that, that an alternative that people can buy into. And we have followed that development very closely um, with, with, you know, with, with a considerable concern uh, that, that it could easily lead to, to uh, an expression of, um, say, nationalism at the level of the regions that, that we see now. Of course, we are worried now. Uh, we're worried about the implications for the region. We're worried about the Sudanese-Ethiopian border. Um, and of course, you also immediately see a, a, a translation of these difficulties in the talks about uh, the GERD, the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, um, as you know, uh, that, that's a real concern 
as it affects the uh, the Nile uh, and therefore Sudan and uh, and Egypt. So politically, we are really engaged. Uh, Alex Rondos, the USR, is is heavily involved. Uh, we're happy that we can uh, provide him with uh, some assistance in this. So there is a lot of political engagement. Uh, of course, together with the key players there, the African Union and um, and the UN. Um, we're really looking forward to the to the visit of uh, of Pekka Avisto that has been asked by by um, the high representative to to be the EU envoy there. And obviously, we're looking forward to a stronger and a more united transatlantic front uh, with the new US uh, administration, as it is really important to team up. I think Ethiopia is one of those countries where you can only say, you know, if you want to do as something as ambitious as to bring peace to a country like that, you will never be able to do that alone. You have to do that with other partners. And therefore, um, we are really looking forward to teaming up with them. Um, partners in, in government and indeed with uh, civil society. Um, many thanks and back to you. Thank you, Rene. So uh, I'd like to turn to now to uh, to the South Caucasus and to nagorno karabakh And if, if the war in Tigray was one new war that, that started last year, another was the, the, the fighting in nagorno karabakh uh, There were these incidents on the border, which led to uh, uh, an offensive by Azerbaijan that ended up with Baku recapturing much of the territory that it had lost uh, three decades uh, before. Olya, um, you and your team have been following the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict very closely. Uh, you, you, you monitor what's happening, uh, what happened with the fighting, what's happening now. Could you very briefly talk a little bit about where things stand now? Uh, and again, uh, explore a little bit how the European Union can help what is is not a stable peace, but a, but a ceasefire, how the European Union can help convert that into something that's more stable. Thank you, uh, Richard. Yeah, so, um, and thanks everybody for taking part in, in this discussion. I've really enjoyed listening uh, to, uh, to all of the conversation so far. So you say um, the war is over in the sense that the fighting is over and uh, in terms of who is in control of what on the ground, it's been a bit of a flip of the situation back in 1994 when the first war ended in that Azerbaijan has regained control of most of the territory that Armenia had gotten control over back, um, back by the end of 1994. The exception is the majority of the breakaway region of Nagorno-Karabakh itself. And um, in the portion that is of that region that Azerbaijan has not gotten hold of, there are Russian peacekeepers deployed, but the self-proclaimed independent Karabakh government is still um, what is effectively in administrative control there. Um, refugees who fled Karabakh, um, Armenian ethnic Armenian refugees who fled, fled Karabakh have been returning in fairly large numbers, uh, not all of them, but many of them, um, those who fled during this most recent fighting. Azerbaijani families and their descendants, uh, their families who had to leave um, that region and the seven uh, parts of Azerbaijan that Armenian forces had captured back in 1994, uh, are very slowly starting to trickle in the infrastructure isn't there. It's, um, you know, it's largely in ruins, but the Azerbaijani government is thinking a lot about how to bring them back. But as you say, what Russia brokered on November 10th uh, to end the war is a ceasefire and not a peace. And to a large extent, there's a lot left undecided intentionally. The tough issues, whether it's status for Karabakh itself or the details of the mandate for Russian peacekeepers are being left to be decided later, maybe in part to be decided by the circumstances as they unfold. For now, uh, what Baku and Yerevan have agreed to, again, under Russian auspices, is to develop working groups to start planning for the economic and transport infrastructure that's going to reconnect the region, right? Because Armenia has been effectively isolated by and from both Azerbaijan and Turkey for these nearly three decades. Now, we don't know how this will work. We don't know what this, how this is all gonna shake out. Um, the Armenian um, domestic political situation is very tenuous in the wake of a military defeat. 
But the question of rebuilding the infrastructure, rebuilding the links in the region does seem to be the obvious place, if not the only place for the EU to get involved. The challenge here, or one of the many challenges is that this is about getting involved in an environment where Moscow is running the show, where Ankara is playing a substantial role. The Russian-Turkish peacekeeping monitoring center is now apparently up and running in Azerbaijan, but the EU and its member states and the United States were pretty much on the margins of getting to ceasefire. Now, this should have really shocked nobody. Um, Russia has for a very long time been the most active and the most engaged outside power uh, in this conflict. And certainly it was the only one that was ready and willing to send peacekeepers and to act quickly. I, mean, I suppose Turkey would have happily sent peacekeepers, but that was going to be a non-starter for Armenia. So in this atmosphere of tremendous tension with Russia over so many things, you have to ask, can the EU get engaged without it seeming like a gift to Russia? You know, and this kind of harkens back to some of the other conversations um, that were um, part of the last panel. And in line with that, I would say that that's exactly what selective engagement is supposed to look like, right? And I would also say that EU engagement is actually critical to making a real peace possible. And that means the infrastructure aid and transport and reconnection is really very much in line with the sort of assistance and engagement the EU has had in the region and with uh, partner countries in the past. It's also continued humanitarian support and healthcare support, which it has already um, undertaken often through international um, organizations. And I think it's also about reinvigorating programs to build ties between societies, which the EU has tried to do over the last 30 years, but um, a process that has become rather stagnant in the face of increasing isolation of these societies from one another. Um, and I would also say that one of the most important things that EU engagement, whether it's through the EU special representative for the region, through the member states, uh, through the OSCE chair in office for 2021, which is Sweden, um, through all of these put together, EU engagement helps ensure that um, Karabakh and its resolution remains a global and not just a regional problem. And I do think that in and of itself is going to be critical to a lasting peace that really does build prosperity uh, in the region. Very good, Olia, thank you so much. Mark, let me, uh, let me turn to you uh, very quickly and uh, we, 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 need to, uh, we need to keep things moving quite fast. As, uh, I realize that with just these first two conflicts, we've already consumed a lot of our, a lot of our time, but Mark, uh, the, the FBI, the Service for Foreign Policy Instruments, you're, you're really on, on the sort of the first line of, of, of the European Union's response in Nagorno-Karabakh. Could you talk a little bit about, about what you're doing, what you're thinking of doing to sort of rebuild peace along the lines that Olya talked about? Yeah, no, thanks very much, Richard. I mean, um, what we've been engaged with, with for over 10 years already now is um, to, to support sort of cross-line um, contacts between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Now, obviously, um, when, when the fighting broke out, um, that, that was made a lot more difficult. Um, but, I mean, one, one thing, one reflection on, on what went before, because, I mean, we've been doing this for 10 years. Normally, we're not meant to be working in one context for such a long time. Uh, and every time we were sort of renewing that program, we were thinking, does this still make sense? Does it still work? Uh, does it still add value? Um, to be supporting something that, you know, at the time people very much described as a frozen conflict, uh, probably wrongly so, <laughs> we now know wrongly so. Um, but I think that sort of building on some of those contacts now um, is, is certainly something that we are looking to do. Um, we need to be very careful in doing that. We, we're working very closely with the EUSR um, and, and the delegations on that. Uh, simply because what, what this uh, recent um, violent conflict uh, has shown is, is, is also that not all of the partners that we have worked with, that with there are equally, equally well placed um, to, to pass a, uh, a message of nonviolence uh, in, in, in these new circumstances now. Um, but for the most part, we have certainly seen that the partners who've had the possibility to have cross-line exchanges over the last 10 years um, have um, tried to maintain those 
uh, where it was no longer possible to do so by travel, uh, and obviously isn't at the moment. Um, they, they are nevertheless trying to remain in touch and are looking into ways into how uh, they, from their perspectives as journalists, as civil society representatives, as business people, can uh, contribute to um, uh, a, a rapprochement between, between uh, um, Azerbaijan and Armenia on, on this sensitive issue. Now, the, the, the new element that we will also be looking at, and I'll stop after that, uh, is, is to look at one of the features of this most recent conflict has been the, the use of social media. Certainly, this isn't the first conflict, but this is happening. But the hate messages about the other side um, uh, that, that have been countering sort of our reconciliation and peace building efforts have, have been promulgated uh, from groups that are close uh, to the two governments and in some cases even uh, uh, within the government it is, it is uh, suspected. And we will be looking at how we can uh, potentially uh, counter that um, in, in, in our work. I'll stop here, Richard. Thank you, Mark. Let's um, let's move now to 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 another conflict, hugely important for uh, for, for 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 Europe, for the European Union, uh, and turn to Yost so you can talk a little bit, Yost, about uh, Libya. There's been this uh, ceasefire uh, last October, uh, which has uh, reduced the levels of violence, uh, but if I understand it, there's still a long way to go. Uh, the formation of an interim government uh, discussions are still underway. Uh, the, uh, some of the uh, terms of the ceasefire are unclear, particularly those related to, 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 to foreign fighters. Uh, could you talk a little bit about where things stand at the moment in Libya? Uh, and again, on, on what Europe, what the European Union, what member states can do to, to, to help build on that, uh, on that ceasefire? Thanks, Richard, and thanks, everyone, um, um, for this discussion on Libya. Uh, first of all, I should say that um, it's... Um, really heartening to see after uh, several years of th things in the Middle East just deteriorating, that finally we have the chance maybe of some kind of reduction in the tensions may because of the Biden administration coming into the Oval Office, but even in Libya where uh, I think that is um, less related, but in Yemen, they're still fighting at the same time we see uh, uh, possibilities of, of uh, a way forward. The, the conflict in Syria is mostly frozen. Now we'll talk about Iran in a minute. Uh, also, the situation may de-escalate. In Libya, importantly, there is a ceasefire after uh, a major offensive that lasted for more than a year on the capital. Uh, and um, uh, But we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, first of all, the ceasefire, as Richard, as you said, um, uh, has not been implemented yet, and I'll give you a little bit of detail in a second. Um, there is a political process, but it is uh, stuttering, um, and it's not clear how it should move forward, how it could move forward, and the EU certainly has a role there. And um, we have also uh, the money problem, um, where uh, oil revenues are, are currently in a frozen account and not accessible, and that needs to become, un, become unfrozen and it cannot wait for a new government to be formed because it doesn't look like a new government will be formed anytime soon. So first of all, the ceasefire. So this is a very welcome development uh, agreed to uh, by the two sides, meaning the government in Tripoli and the uh, Haftar controlled side uh, in the east uh, in October, um, which called for a withdrawal from the front lines by the respective military forces a halt to external training uh, of uh, these military forces, a withdrawal of uh, private military contractors, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are the main issues. Now, what we've seen since then is none of this has happened, um, but the ceasefire is still there. In other words, there has not been a return to fighting. Uh, uh, military cargo planes continue to touch down uh, on the on both sides, uh, coming in from from outside, be it from uh, this, uh, the Haftar side, which is supported by the UAE and Russia uh, and Egypt, or on the Tripoli government side, which is supported by uh, Turkey and Qatar, um, most of all. So that's one thing. The uh, private military contractors of the Wagner company, the Russian company, are still on the Haftar side. They are present on the ground. Not fighting at the moment, but they're there and they should have been withdrawn. And there are other private military contractors on that side as well that are still remaining on the ground. Um, 
and the forces uh, of the two sides haven't really withdrawn from the front lines. They're still there. So, so this has to happen. Now, the United Nations has proposed a ceasefire monitoring mechanism with the agreement of the two sides in the Libyan conflict. Um, and so there is a, an, an initial agreement to, to deploy uh, civilian unarmed monitors. Uh, and these would supposedly come from some European countries that the Libyan sides can agree to. This has yet to happen. So what can the EU do now to move this forward? Well, it should support the monitoring mechanism and make available monitors uh, when that moment comes. So that is, that is critical. It should support a new, more detailed ceasefire agreement that goes into some of the, the problems with the existing one um, and uh, flesh it out and then have, uh, put, you know, ask the United Nations Security Council to, to support it in a, in a resolution. I think that's very important. And the Operation Irini of the European Union it can do also its uh, bit in uh, monitoring troop movements and alerting um, the world to any uh, troop movements that might violate uh, the ceasefire. Um, that's on the military side, linked directly to the ceasefire. Then there is the political side. Now, there are political talks that are going on. Uh, the two parallel rival parliaments in the East and the West are meeting to discuss the establishment of an interim government that would then organize uh, elections by the end of the year, maybe parliamentary and presidential and local. It's not entirely clear that ne this needs to be sorted out. Um, now, this is supposed to happen, these, this, uh, this interim government by the end of, uh, or some kind of agreement anyway on the procedures for establishing one by the end of this month. Um, and it doesn't look that's, like that's going to happen. And the alternative, the fallback, if you will, is that there is a second mechanism uh, that consists of seven, 75 delegates selected by the United Nations or selected, you know, under the supervision of the United Nations, who also have been meeting, and who who could, as a fallback, also uh, establish an interim government. Um, so, if the the two parliaments fail to do so, then these 75 delegates could move toward it. But there are many many divisions between them, as you can imagine, uh, and so even there, the path is not uh, is not clear. The, the the second fallback, if all of that fails, is to just go ahead and organize at least parliamentary elections by December of this year. Um, for that, there has to be a new electoral law. So again, it's not going to be easy, straightforward. Um, and it, electronic voting cards will have to be issued and, and things like that. But, um, you know, what is the alternative? The alternative in the end is a return to fighting. And that, of course, we need to prevent. So uh, the EU can do much to, to support the, the political process and nudge the parties through the uh, external sponsors of the, of the various parties to the conflict and directly uh, by working with the uh, Libyan actors to steer them in the in the in the right direction. Finally, on the um, on the uh, the income side of things, the the revenues have been uh, put in a, oil revenues have been put in a special account since September. Again, an agreement between the Tripoli government and the Haftar side. Um, that money was uh, meant to come unfrozen when an interim government was in place. That has not happened because there is no interim government. There has to be another mechanism, and the EU could also use its good offices with the two sides to find a mechanism to unfreeze that. And I think part of that would have to include some kind of reassurance to the Haftar side that the money that accrues to the central budget and therefore to the Tripoli government would not be used to finance the Tripoli side's military forces at the exclusion of the Haftar's military forces. And that the money would then be spent to the benefit of all Libyans and not just uh, in the West, for example, as opposed to the whole country. Yes, thank you very much. Rene, let me turn, turn to you for a quick response. As, I mean, as, as, as Joost has outlined, uh, European countries aren't in, as involved in Libya as uh, some of the direct backers of, of the two sides, whether it's Turkey or, or the Emirates or, or, or Russia. But there is still an enormous amount that, 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 that Europe can do, as, as, as Yo said, whether it's supporting the ceasefire, monitoring the ceasefire, pushing the parties towards compromise, nudging their external backers to, to in turn push them towards compromise. Do, do, could, you, could you reflect a little bit on some of what Joost said and, and, and what the External Action Service is doing? Yeah, thanks. Uh, that would be my pleasure to 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 do so. Um, 
of course, you 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 will not see the EU um, active in Libya in the same way as you see um, as you call them the the external backers. Uh, but let me give you a hint, uh, an indication of of what it is that that is indeed happening. Uh, Libya is of course uh, tremendously important to the EU. It is literally on our doorstep, and and the future of of Libya is therefore of of uh, a real relevance to uh, to the EU. Um, so that's why we are really supporting uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the offices of the uh, UNSRSG. And we're tremendously happy with the appointment of Jan Kubic as the new uh, uh, SRSG and, and really looking forward to, uh, to working with him. So the UN is indeed in the lead of that overall peace process. Um, and, um, you know, what, what, what we are doing is supporting the UN uh, with a strategy that is focusing on fostering dialogue uh, through a number of projects, many of the projects funded through uh, uh, Mark's outfit, the FPI, the, the ICSB funded projects, and some of them have been tremendously successful and indeed have been the basis for the current ceasefire. So I think the EU is sometimes a little bit too modest. Um, the role that we play is, is, is indeed sometimes critically important. What we try to do in Libya is, is, is have the whole uh, range of interventions, so you will see a strong uh, support to fostering this dialogue, uh, you know, for example, through the, the national dialogue process that has been happening over the last uh, few years, but also contributing to the enforcement of the UN arms embargo. That is not always difficult to see what the impact is, but I think that through this Operation Irini, um, it has indeed become a lot more difficult to bring in weapons into Libya. Um, has that meant that there are no weapons? No, of course not. But it is indeed a lot more difficult than it was in the past. So these these interventions are, are surely important. Um, to give you another um, um, uh, suggestion, and, and Joost was, was referring to it already, the economic dimension is, of course, critically important. Well, here the EU is co-chairing the economic working group, as it has been created under the, what they call the, the Berlin process. And that group is actually making most of the progress of all the working groups that, that exist. So all the issues that Joost mentions are being discussed and actually almost to the surprise of, of colleagues working on those issues, they really make progress on the unification of the budget, on the distribution of oil revenues, on the functioning of the central bank, all of that. There are very positive uh, developments there and most of them are now basically requiring a political agreement. And of course, that's where the pain is. So we need as well progress on the political track. So here, very important to reach out diplomatically uh, to indeed all these external backers to make sure that the Libyans are able to take decisions that are in the interest of their own people without uh, of the, the, the interference of, of, these, of these other actors. So uh, you can imagine that that requires very intensive uh, diplomatic engagements with uh, the familiar big parties that are uh, of influence to the Libyan process. So these are exciting times now. Uh, as you know, from the 1st of February to until the end of this week, uh, they are in Geneva, the Libyan uh, political uh, dialogue forum, uh, indeed to vote on uh, a new uh, presidency council. Let's see what comes out of that. I had the pleasure to work a few years on Libya, and I know that time is often uh, has a bit of a different dimension there, uh, so that may take a bit longer, but um, we are uh, positive that something constructive will come out. A last few words. Yes, we are talking to the UN about how we can contribute to the ceasefire. Um, that is not easy, as you can imagine, um, because here the Libyans are, are, are very clear in what it is that they are not willing to accept. Uh, and so whatever we will do there, um, I can assure you we will do that 
while fully respecting the principles of, of Libyan ownership. And I hope that um, at the next uh, forum like this, I'm able to tell you in a bit more detail what it is that, that we can concretely do to contribute to monitoring the uh, still holding ceasefire, uh, which, is, which is in itself, of course, already quite a success. Um, let me end here. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. We'll, we'll look forward to some of those discussions uh, with you. Let's. Um, we're 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 uh, we're not running out of time, but we but we have got a lot of questions that are building up in the uh, in the in the Q and A box, which is great. So let's let's move to now to uh, to to Latin America. Uh, Ivan, we talked very briefly. Uh, I talked very briefly about Venezuela in the first panel. Uh, could I ask you to talk uh, in a bit more depth and and with more eloquence than I managed to uh, about uh, about where the crisis in Venezuela stands, and in particular, what a new uh, administration in the U.S. means after four years or, or some years of, of, of maximum pressure, a strategy that I, that I think has has, has largely uh, backfired. What should the approach now of, of of Europe be? How should it work with the U.S. to think through think through a new Venezuela policy? Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you to everybody in this event. Uh, I mean, Richard, you you summarised the problems with the maximum pressure strategy and where it's left Venezuela very nicely. So I, I won't go over that again. Uh, but I think it's important to consider what the new US government means, not just for Venezuela, but for the whole of Latin America. Um, it's obviously extremely important. It's, if you like, the regional hegemon. Uh, but Trump's policy was uh, dual, as it were, to Latin America. You had maximum pressure and extreme confrontation with a number of states, Venezuela, Cuba in particular, uh, obviously the issue of migration with Mexico, although that ended up in an extremely good relationship between Trump and the Mexican president. And for the rest of Latin America, largely indifference, a degree of permissiveness, a degree of detachment, unless there were core US security strategic, uh, strategic interests uh, involved. So this has obviously changed. Uh, the Biden administration has made it very clear, senior officials made it very clear that there will be much more engagement in Latin America. We're returning to the language of partnership, of, of multilateralism, of uh, a joint focus on some core issues such as climate change, security challenges, um, the rule of law, corruption, uh, and a turn away from maximum pressure. For all the reasons you mentioned, Richard, it hasn't proved effective. It consolidated uh, the regime rather than fracturing it. Uh, and, uh, and, and the offensive uh, launched by Juan Guaido with US uh, support didn't end up working. So the US and the EU now are, are broadly on the same page. Today, uh, there has been a video conference of the International Contact Group to discuss the state of, of play uh, regarding Venezuela, what could be done with negotiations. The, the US clearly is looking towards uh, a path uh, of negotiations towards a settlement, but both the US and the EU are also extremely critical of the Maduro government for obvious reasons. It's a repressive authoritarian government now. Uh, it has systematically denied or curbed humanitarian aid and it is largely responsible for the huge exodus um, from the country. So it's very difficult to be um, immediately open uh, uh, towards the, the Maduro government. So, um, so what, what can be done in this situation? Well, I think the bottom line is that the, within Venezuela, uh, the circumstances are, remain extremely hard. It's difficult to see how the two sides could immediately in the short term get together around a table and, and start talking. There is a, a crackdown uh, ongoing. There are still hundreds of political prisoners. Uh, there are extrajudicial executions taking place. There are arrests of humanitarian actors and human rights activists occurring very frequently. These are not conditions in which talking between the sides is at all easy. Um, and of course, Latin America remains highly polarized. Venezuela has still got its two main neighbors. Uh, Colombia and Brazil are still highly antagonistic towards the Maduro government, which doesn't make uh, Maduro and his ministers feel particularly comfortable about sitting down for talks either. So what could, be do, what could be done by the US and the EU since they share similar values, similar approaches to, to, to get things going in Venezuela? Well, well, I think the first step has to be, uh, you know, taking the model of the international contact group and broadening 
engagement by the US and the EU in Latin America and also with the supporters of, of Maduro. I think it's very important that all Latin American countries are brought on board the idea of a structured, peaceful settlement in Venezuela. And that includes those democratic governments, democratic left governments, such as Argentina and Mexico and Bolivia, that are a little bit skeptical towards the, uh, towards the US position over the last few years. And it also involves talking to Maduro's allies. Cuba is particularly important in this regard, and that and a lot will depend on the US seeking to renormalize its relationships with Cuba, Cuba and encouraging Cuba to support this multilateral effort. It's not going to be easy uh, at all. And obviously, Russia and China are also very important factors, given that they have allowed, they've enabled Maduro to survive economically over the last few years. Um, realism on all sides is absolutely essential. In the opposition side, I don't think there will be any possibility of talks if the primary condition is that Maduro has stepped down immediately. So I think there's going to have to be some rethinking uh, around that. Uh, humanitarian aid is essential, uh, but that will also require a degree of confidence building between the sides and uh, could be used as, uh, as a stepping stone towards political talks. Um, and lastly, and I think this is this is a really crucial one because it's the incentive structure, the main incentive structure, which the US has to play with. The EU doesn't have it so much because it's uh, because its sanctions are, 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 are individually focused, but the sanctions imposed by the US over the last few years since 2017 have affected the entire Venezuelan economy, have made it very difficult for Venezuela to get over this, this, this extreme economic collapse, which is the responsibility of the government but made worse by sanctions. So connecting sanctions lifting with moves by the Venezuelan government to, uh, to lift its crackdown, to release prisoners, to re-establish political and civil rights, uh, probably under a UN uh, monitoring uh, uh, um, umbrella, would be the way forward, the ideal way forward. But that will require diplomatic channels and a, a degree of confidence. So uh, we hope that this will get the process moving, but it's it's going to be difficult in the coming months. Thank you very much, Ivan. Thank you so much. So um, uh, we're going to move on in a moment to Iran. I would just say to the to the panelists, if you look at the Q&A, there's questions that are coming up there. There's quite a few questions there already. I will, uh, uh, after a couple more uh, interventions from, from, from you all, I will come to some of these questions and and so think through those that uh, that that think through your answers to those that most <laughs> make most sense for you. Um, Yos, let's let's talk uh, a little bit about Iran. We 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 talked in the earlier uh, group about how maximum pressure there. You know, if it had fallen short in in Venezuela, it was uh, it was really a failure uh, in Iran. Now there's a new U.S. administration, as you mentioned, new opportunity for Europe to to help the US get back to the to the JCPOA to have a new approach towards Iran to calm this increasingly perilous standoff that, that Washington and Tehran have had across the region. Uh, what do you think should be the next steps uh, for the Biden administration? How can the, uh, the how can Europe, how can the European Union support that? Thanks, Richard. So so we have clearly articulated um, our positions on what should happen next. Uh, these uh, positions we articulated at a time that Rob Malley was still our president and CEO, so he was very much, it was very much put his stamp on it. Now he has gone to the Biden administration to become the Iran envoy, and we can only hope that he will implement the recommendations that he made uh, to uh, the Biden administration before he joined it. So um, um, we uh, very much want uh, a quick return to the JCPOA as it stood in 2015. Uh, we don't want to tinker with the deal at this stage um, because we think that that could become an endless process that probably will fail in the end. Um, so uh, the better way is a clean uh, re, uh, US re-entry into the deal uh, and a simultaneous and then the, the, you know, the, the exact um, mechanism uh, to synchronize these steps by the two sides would have to be worked out. But a simultaneous um, a reversal by Iran of the various steps that it has taken over the last uh, two or three years uh, to uh, violate uh, the JC its commitments under the JCPOA. 
Um, and of course, and this is for Iran, uh, the most important part uh, for the United States to lift the sanctions that the Trump administration imposed on Iran after, um, uh, made, well, after it withdrew from the JCPOA in May 2018. So that, that, is, that is, would be step number one, but the, the choreography is going to be tricky. And there are a number of considerations. One, of course, from the Iranian side is why would you trust the United States again? Uh, if it's, uh, it comes to an agreement and then the next administration cancels it. And I think you, Richard, already mentioned earlier that, you know, we don't know who will be in the White House four years from now. Um, and it may well be uh, uh, an administration that is uh, adversarial to the whole notion of multilateral deals and uh, uh, non-proliferation agreements. So there's that. And the other thing is, is that um, the, the JCPOA was uh, accomplished um, by carving it out from other issues that divided, especially the United States and Iran. Of course, it's uh, broader than the United States, but it's especially the United States. And that includes um, the uh, Iranian ballistic missile program. It includes uh, its uh, regional power projection, and it includes um, its human rights situation at home. Um, these are issues that were left out. Um, that is why the nuclear deal uh, could come to be. And, um, but, but, but those issues uh, uh, cannot be left unaddressed. And I think the Obama administration realized that, but it didn't uh, have the time to, uh, to move forward on these matters until it was replaced by the Trump administration, which of course then pursued the maximum pressure campaign. Um, but there are states and uh, US allies in the region, especially Saudi Arabia, Israel, um, United Arab and Emirates and some others are very keen uh, for, for um, these issues to be put back on the table and for them to have a voice in any um, negotiation over a uh, restoration of the JCPOA and a follow-on deal. Um, and that is going to be the, the very difficult task that the Biden team uh, under Rob Malley is going to face. But the EU can, can play a very helpful role. In the initial stages, I think there, there have to be, uh, also from the United States, but there has to be some messaging that makes clear that the intent is uh, to return to the deal. And I think even uh, appointing Rob Malley is a clear message by the United States to Iran that uh, the United States means business. It wants to go back to the deal and it wants to make a good faith effort to do so, regardless of the difficulty. Um, and the European Union can, can help with that um, by um, maybe uh, reviving the plan that, uh, that um, um, President Macron uh, launched a couple of years ago about the pre-purchase of Iranian oil, for example, in exchange, of course, uh, for no further Iranian violations of the, of the deal. Those have to, to be halted. Um, Europe can also uh, provide uh, additional humanitarian aid or facilitate other uh, international humanitarian aid to Iran because of COVID, of course. And it can uh, help uh, usher in a uh, uh, IMF uh, loan, again, for the COVID situation uh, that has been uh, blocked so far by the United States. Um, and it can uh, promote trade because INSTEX, uh, the mechanism that was there to promote trade between Europe and, and, and Iran, you know, it hasn't really functioned. It functions symbolically more than anything. Uh, but that symbolism uh, vanished rather quickly in Iranian eyes because the reality wasn't there in any substantive way. Um, and, and Europe can help maybe by providing uh, encouragement to companies that are fearful of sanctions still uh, if they engage in business with Iran. They can, the European Union can provide tax breaks uh, to companies to encourage them uh, and uh, consider other uh, 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 mechanisms to, uh, to speed up uh, trade with Iran. Um, and I think finally, it is very important uh, for Europe to also play a role that the Biden administration should not be playing directly, but can support indirectly, which is to encourage uh, an intra-Gulf, meaning between the GCC, Iran and Iraq dialogue that is inclusive of these sta uh, eight states um, uh, on sec the security in the Gulf. And it is both hard security and soft security. Um, that is a critical role uh, uh, or a critical uh, thing that needs to happen. And European governments, uh, with the help of the, uh, with uh, Mr. Borrell, with the help of uh, um, the UN Secretary General, uh, can uh, encourage the Gulf states to take that kind of courageous uh, initiative. And those discussions I know are taking place already and can now step up because we know 
uh, that the Biden administration, uh, it still needs to uh, come out explicitly and say so, but uh, does support such an initiative. Very good. Yes, thank you very much. So we've, we've talked a little bit about the, uh, the implications of a new team in the US, uh, and, uh, the Biden administration, for the conflicts in, in Iran and in Venezuela. I want to stay on that theme, uh, but come off the, the watch list just for a moment. And Oli, I'll ask you a little bit about Europe-Russia relations, given their importance. Uh, could you reflect a little bit on, on, on uh, Brussels' relationship with Moscow, European capital's relationship with Moscow, and what a new team in Washington uh, might mean for that? Sure, uh, thanks. Um, so the having a team in Washington that uh, is clearly committed to Euro-Atlantic cooperation uh, makes for space to align and smarten the policy towards Russia that frankly hasn't been there over the last four years. That doesn't mean that that's easy, right? It's a huge complicated agenda. Relations between Western countries and Russia are tense to say the least. They're certainly not improving. The war in Ukraine is a critical linchpin, but it's uh, hard to look at that and see a lot of promise of positive movement there until and unless Russia and honestly also Ukraine shift policies. Uh, as of now, much of uh, EU and US policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia is tied to Ukraine and specifically to Russian implementation of the Minsk agreements. But while Russia certainly bears much responsibility, it can't implement Minsk by itself. And Ukraine's bottom line position on the agreements is that the deal needs to be adapted or at least interpreted something other than literally. And in the meantime, you do have all of these other problems, dangerous military incidents in the near the Baltic Sea area, military buildups in near the Black Sea, months on end of violent crackdowns on protests in Belarus, and of course, Nagorno-Karabakh, which we already talked to that. Add to that, um, Mr. Navalny, uh, whose sentencing we've been promised uh, to hear the results of in about 20 minutes. And you get a package in which there's a lot that Brussels and Washington might want to do vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but their leverage tools don't quite match their desires. So this is gonna take smart diplomacy, realistic engagement, and perhaps some redefinition of red lines uh, to make sure they're credible to move forward. For Ukraine, we've written about this before. Um, and the argument we've made is that the current framework of the sanctions regime, and here I'm echoing my colleagues uh, in a lot of ways, with its all or nothing conditions tied to the Minsk agreement, haven't changed Moscow's policy. They've sent signals of dissatisfaction, absolutely. They've possibly punished uh, Russia and maybe some Russians, but they haven't, um, don't seem to have changed Moscow's policy, at least not recently. So if we want real progress, we need Russia towards to accept Ukraine sovereignty and to get its forces and its support out of Ukraine. And we need Ukraine to start truly planning to integrate the territory in its east, the whole point of this war. Um, and I mentioned that because we do have a strong movement in Ukraine um, to basically walk away from that and accept, uh, accept a frozen conflict. So with neither facing an incentive, can the EU and the US together change that? And we would argue that by smartening up sanctions to make them a little more flexible, both to give Russia incentive to compromise and to give Brussels and Washington room to escalate if they don't. And also to make clear that Ukraine, that support and assistance are tied to reintegrating Donbass. And thus, this means disengaging forces, promoting cross-line trade and contacts and so forth. You could get some movement. Um, now, progress on European security writ large goes hand in hand with progress on Ukraine. They're interdependent, but you do also need that movement. The US has taken an important step forward by working with Moscow to extend New START. Conversations with Russia about security are probably more NATO's job than the, that of the EU, but the countries affected are pretty much the same. So working with the Americans and the Russians, perhaps to save the Open Skies Treaty, that might be a good first priority, but Baltic and Black Sea security are gonna be on the agenda. Um, but it's a big agenda and it's a difficult agenda. And by laying these things out, I don't want to in any way um, minimize the difficulty. I do think having leadership in Washington willing to work with, collaborate with, listen to European allies increases the odds of success. 
Thank you, Olia. Uh, Rene, can I bring you in briefly? So we, we reflected in the first panel with uh, Mr. Sanino a little bit about what the new US administration might mean for Europe's uh, crisis management, its efforts to resolve some of the conflicts on, the, on, the, uh, on our watch list this time. Do you want to reflect a little bit on that as well? Oh, that's a tricky one. I wasn't there, so I, I run a risk to uh, to uh, say something else as, as my new uh, secretary general. So uh, you put me uh, in the hot seat here. Um, well, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's one thing is clear for there's a few things that where the EU has always been very clear, and that is we need a multilateral system. So for us, a rules based global order is absolutely essential. We are dead convinced that without that, we will not be able to achieve peace, security, and, and, and prevent conflicts. Um, and that's great if we feel that in Europe, but if you are alone and you have no partners, then the whole thing becomes a little bit more difficult. And I think that is sort of what happened over the last few years. So we really regretted uh, the withdrawal of the previous US administration from a from number of multilateral engagements. And to be honest, they were not really there to pass that same message. Um, for the EU, that was an important realization. Uh, initially, maybe even a little shock. And, and so as a tiny silver lining of, of these last four years, I think what we've seen in Europe is, is a reflection where we said, you know, we need to be able to, to you know, stand our own ground in a stronger way as the EU. So uh, you've probably seen uh, the high representative during the Foreign Affairs Council in December, where he talked about developing proposals on how to strengthen the EU's diplomatic toolbox and instruments uh, to help strengthen our resilience and influence in the world. Um, and he used this, this often misunderstood phrase of strategic autonomy. I mean, for me, strategic autonomy doesn't mean that the EU wants to do it alone, not at all. Uh, we will always will remain committed to, to this um, multilateralism, but it means that we should indeed be more able to stand our own ground, and um, when we when we are going to look at the new transatlantic relations, uh, and we are really looking forward to developing them, uh, then I think they will, in that sense, be different, uh, because I think we are better placed now with a stronger position towards building those relations and and able to articulate our sort of uh, uh, own geopolitical uh, orientations. Um, it's, it's, I mean, there, there's basically no end to where you can engage. If you have uh, an ally like the US, uh, we talked about uh, Iran, we talked about, uh, the, the, uh, Olga talked about um, Russia, Ukraine, our neighborhood, Horn of Africa, critically important, Latin America, we, we heard Ivan talk about that, Asia, the Indo-Pacific, I mean, it's, it's, um, I, I really hope that Blinken have, will, will soon have his team together because there will be no end to the number of dossiers that uh, that we should uh, jointly discuss. Uh, in international fora, of course, being able to speak the same language, agree on these broad, big principles will help to push peace building and, and conflict prevention policies. Uh, so you need to have partners to do that, uh, to push democracy and human rights and, and the rule of law and peace and all these values that we thought were almost a given and where all of a sudden really realized over the last four years that even those are, are, are not sacred anymore. So uh, we are really enthusiastic about the signals coming from, from Washington and, and look forward to uh, re-engaging with them again. Thank you. Rene, thank you very much. So we have um, we have about half an hour left on the panel. So what I thought I'd do was um, give you all four minutes, uh, as the six of you, and give Comfort a little bit longer because she has a few other questions to deal with. And we, I'll ask you to, to 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 we'll go around again, and I'll ask each of you to have a sort of last word. Um, any reflections on anything that we've talked about, anything else that you would like to highlight in your regions. And I'll, as I come to each of you, I'll ask you uh, whichever questions are relevant to you that have come up from the, uh, from the Q&A. 
If there are other questions as I go through in the Q&A, please don't hesitate to type them in. We'll do our best to cover them. Um, but we'll, we'll try to do the last half an hour like that. So um, we'll go in a, in a slightly different order. Uh, Ivan, let's uh, start with you, if that's, uh, if that's okay. Um, we've got uh, questions for you, one on Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Which actor or combination of actors <clears throat> has the leverage to convince President Maduro to stand down? That's the first one. Uh, we've got a question on the, uh, the terrible impact of the COVID pandemic uh, across uh, Latin America, which, which you can see. Um, what, is, what, is, what is happening and what can, uh, what can Europe do to, to, to help? Mm. Uh, you've got another one about how uh, the EU and others can support civil society in a country like Venezuela, given some of the restrictions and civil political rights. Mm. Uh, so you've got that question. Um, and you could also, in your four minutes, <laughs> if you would like to reflect a little bit on uh, our entry on Mexico and Central America uh, and looking at how uh, the relationship between the pandemic and, and levels of violence, how that's played out there. If you can manage that as well, uh, you definitely get a medal. Thank you very much, uh, Richie. Well, I'll do my best. How to make Maduro stand down? Well, very difficult because the more you press, the more you push, the less likely he is to do so. Uh, the reason for that, uh, well, there are various reasons, but one of the fundamental ones is the nature of Chavismo. It has a rhetoric, political rhetoric, about the defense of the nation, the sovereign, uh, the sovereign defense of the nation, which might seem superficially un insignificant. It might seem that that's just a pretense for what is otherwise a criminal uh, illicit profiteering uh, political movement. But the fact of the matter is that has kept the alliance between the civilian and the military wings together because everybody understands in the Chavista movement that they're in it, they're in it together. And Maduro is their best source of defense. With Maduro, uh, they will at least have a future more guaranteed than with the United States and with the, with the opposition. So Maduro's in charge. I mean, he has survived. He is politically utterly dominant at the moment after last year's legislative elections. How do you get him to stand down? Well, I think you've got to look uh, fundamentally at Chavismo itself. At some stage, he will stand down and he will be replaced. There will be a generational uh, change. Um, but forcing him out of power and holding uh, Chavismo against the wall is not the way forward. I think if there is a relaxation of pressure, if there is an attempt to start real negotiations on the future of Venezuela with all sides, then at a certain moment, Maduro might just step down on his own. Um, I don't think there is a secret formula. Uh, that said, the question about civil society is very relevant. It's very important for you to support civil society. It is a particularly dark moment in Venezuela with a huge 80% uh, collapse of the economy since 2013 with the exodus, with all these ongoing human rights violations. That support is absolutely essential to bring to light the challenges which people are facing and, and to make sure that there is at least some possibility of redress in the future. And that brings me to the very important radical issue of the International Criminal Court potential full investigation into crimes against humanity in Venezuela. I can't dwell on that, but that's going to be an important event in this year because it will obviously be uh, either an issue which can be uh, dealt with by the Venezuelan government, which will make efforts to bring in international monitoring to deal with its violations, or it will refuse any such cooperation with the ICC, and that will be a very difficult moment then for Venezuela. More just on COVID. Um, Mexico. I want to say something particularly about Mexico. It's in the EU watch list. It's about the security situation there, which remains very serious. 35,000 people murdered last year. But Mexico's COVID pandemic is is terrible uh, 160,000 dead a severe undercount of the reality of the situation a very important economic uh, effect of covid and and uh, obviously the the likelihood as both the, the health effects and the economic effects continue uh, without a mass vaccination campaign in place that this will reinforce uh, criminal organizations we're already seeing, uh, to a degree, this in Mexico. We're seeing in Colombia the very worrying effects of uh, recruitment of young people because schools remain closed in Colombia. They have remained closed since uh, March of last year. 
97% estimated of uh, uh, Latin American children are not able, have not been able to go to school in that time. And these are very worrying trends in, indeed. So I, I think that, that what the EU should be thinking of doing, obviously, the focus in the EU, Europe and North America is, is one domestic vaccination programs at the moment. But at a certain moment uh, when they are largely completed or even before then, if possible, uh, there is going to have to be support for Latin America to vaccinate, to uh, you know, support the public health systems. And of course, uh, to support the economies which have been very badly hit and will continue to be badly hit. And this is an ambitious uh, a program. But uh, in, the, in the, the case of Mexico and Central America in particular, there's also got to be a focus on the security implication for what's gone on. Uh, other countries in Latin America saw a big reduction in violence last year, and that includes the country and I'm in, uh, Colombia, which saw its lowest level of murders for 50 years uh, last year, particularly in urban areas. But in, uh, in, in, in Central America and Mexico, there wasn't nearly so much uh, of a reduction. And as, and as I said, uh, the, the situation in Central America has been made worse by these two hurricanes uh, of last year. And so um, I think it's important that EU supports efforts, innovative efforts to change the approach towards these security problems. And uh, alongside that supports the re-adapter, the re-adoption rather of anti-corruption mechanisms and policies which were uh, basically abandoned during the Trump years by Honduras and Guatemala and to a degree by Mexico as well. So I think that's a, a pretty big agenda for the coming years. Ivan, thank you very much. That's a, a, a lot covered in, in, uh, in a short period of time. A little over four minutes though, so we, we are going to have to, everyone else is going to have to be, we're going to, I'm going to have to be stricter with you, otherwise we're not going to finish on time. But Ivan, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, could I could I turn to you to um, there's, there's, there were uh, there was a question on the Central African Republic, um, but also really anything you'd like to reflect on after the panel, the, the, the way you see the, the role of the FBI, uh, anything you'd like to reflect on that, that that others said. How there was a question on on supporting uh, the you know the critical uh, women, peace, and security agenda, and what the FBI is is doing to do that. Uh, so please. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. I think I think maybe before coming to some of the um, um, specific questions, let me briefly sort of just remind everybody that um, the 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 background to this event um, and and to our collaboration with with um, International Crisis Group is really one of of conflict prevention. Um, it's it's in the nature of an event like this that we tend to look at um, crises that have already broken out or where things are already uh, boiling up. Um, but, but I think the, the essential part um, that we're trying to get to with this exercise and several other exercises that we're carrying out with other partners is for the EU to, to be able to engage uh, in a preemptive way uh, before conflicts become violent, uh, ideally. And so um, let me, in that spirit, maybe come to some of the questions that were asked. Um, I, I saw there was a question about uh, whether the EES, the EU, is, is, is aware of how uh, indigenous communities are currently struggling, um, not only indigenous communities, but, but communities overall, with the spread of, of, of extractive industries or the, 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 the more aggressive um, uh, approach of extractive industries um, under the guise of, of the COVID measures. Uh, yes, we are aware of that, um, and, and I can tell you also how we are more and more aware of it, and that has a lot to do with the Kimberley process, um, where, where for, for the um, mining of diamonds, um, there, there's been over the last uh, couple of decades by now, um, a civil society um, coalition brought uh, about and working across uh, the world in, in diamond producing countries observing very closely how extractive industries are acting and, and looking to protect um, uh, not only indigenous communities, but also artisanal miners. Uh, so indeed we are aware of, of the, the, the particular situation that, that these communities are facing. And I expect that um, once COVID-19 uh, will have um, subsided in importance, uh, we will see a lot more of those effects and we will need to um, uh, develop strategies on, on how to address them. I also want to briefly come in on, on Fernando's point on, on gender and conflict because um, he was referring to, to the root causes there, but 
it's not only um, in the root causes, but also in, in the response to conflict and in the prevention of conflict that uh, gender plays an, an incredibly important role. We don't uh, necessarily always look closely enough at um, the role that, that women and men play uh, and how they are affected differently by conflict. Um, one of the steps that, that we are currently taking uh, to try and, and improve our own performance on that is, is to make sure that we systematically, every new activity uh, that we start will go through sort of a, a diversity check uh, where we will look at um, how far have uh, uh, age, uh, ethnicity, um, but also sex uh, differences been taken properly into account in the design of the activity to make sure that we can draw on um, uh, the, 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 the capacities and the strength of, of everyone to, to bring about peace. Um, let, let me very briefly then um, say also that, of course, in addition to the activities that we are carrying out um, through our crisis response funding, um, but also through our conflict prevention funding, which will continue in, in a very similar way as, as many of you have come accustomed to under the instrument contributed to disability and peace. There will of course now also be uh, the European Peace Facility for work with military actors um, that is starting up and that will certainly change the way um, that the EU can engage in the security and in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the field of conflict prevention. Um, by uh, taking a principled, principled approach to working with the security sector uh, in third countries. In the interest of time, I'll stop here. Thanks very much, Richard. Mark, thank you very much. That was uh, very, very comprehensive. Um, Joost, uh, let's uh, turn to you if that's okay. So we, for you, we have this uh, question on uh, what can the, uh, the EU mission, the uh, IRINI, do to, to, to stop weapons getting into Libya? Is it, is it about actually stopping or is it more about reporting and raising awareness? Uh, well, I, I'd much rather that, uh, that a uh, EU official answer that question. Um, um, but, but I would say that uh, Irini has been more effective at uh, preventing uh, weapons from arriving by, uh, by sea than it has been in preventing weapons arriving by air. And, um, and I think that is, a, that is continues to be a serious problem until now. Uh, how exactly it would go about that, um, so I leave, I leave to colleagues. But I wanted to make a different point about uh, Libya, which is that you know, there was an important lesson that uh, arose from the experience of two, 2011 and the military intervention that um, ousted uh, Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, which is that if, if a military intervention takes place without any effort at state building, I'm not saying anything new here, um, uh, it's just not enough. And, um, and now we see the results of, of uh, the lack of a serious international investment in the post-regime order. Um, and the thing is, if, if, if now no serious attempt is made to rectify that, then the problem will just fester uh, and and uh, the manifestations of which, which are the migrants coming through Libya and possibly refugees in the future, uh, possibly jihadists and, and other issues that are important to Europe, they will continue. And so we need to go back, uh, and I, I think my colleagues already mentioned it in Libya and efforts are being made, uh, but I, I cannot stress enough the importance of this is that uh, we need to get governing right in Libya. And of course, the first step is a ceasefire. And then the second step is, an interim unity government, but it is unifying the parallel institutions that came out of the political crisis in 2014. Um, so, so that must be an absolute uh, top priority. One quick word on Iran as well. It is great if uh, the United States and um, uh, Iran can come, uh, both sides can come back to the nuclear deal and reinstate it in, it, in full. Um, but that, in, that is not going to restore uh, everything that is uh, that goes back 40 years to basically the, the crisis after the Islamic revolution um, and the relations between the United States and Iran, or Iran would say since 1953 in the coup. But um, for that reason, it is really critical that there be an additional effort to, to, to try to address the longer term tensions in the Gulf. And that's where a Gulf-based dialogue encouraged by outside parties is so important. So it is not something that, um, you know, is something that we can do on the side in order to facilitate the, the nuclear talks. 
it is something that is needed for the longer term beyond any kind of nuclear deal. Yes, thank you very much. Rene, I'm gonna uh, turn to you. Um, perhaps not with specific questions, but would you like to reflect on anything that, uh, that, that others have said? Uh, any other things that, uh, that have struck you in the watch list or, or, or the discussion today? Uh, that's, uh, that's the most difficult question uh, of all of them. Uh, thanks for that uh, one, uh, Richard. Um, what can I say? Um, I mean, it's clear that COVID is, is, has such an incredible impact uh, that we really need to, to monitor that very closely. Um, of course, you, you, you've all heard about the Team Europe um, uh, initiative something like 30 billion euro, the EU and the member states to, 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 to help all the countries affected. Uh, that's an important contribution and it will never be enough. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to help our colleagues uh, in delegations, uh, our, our geographical colleagues here in Brussels, with providing them with guidance on what should you be looking out for. Uh, so for example, now we're looking at what are the economic implications of COVID and how does that relate to the risk of, of conflict? Um, COVID will not just be a, a, an unfortunate event, but, but it will really have very far reaching implications. And I think we should all be um, very much aware of that and, and constantly adjust our, our toolbox in order to respond to this. Um, there was a question about, do you do enough about conflict analysis? Um, well, we're actually in, in, in quite an exciting moment uh, in that. I, I wish I had more time. Uh, then I could tell you a bit more about um, conflict analysis that we are doing and, and, and are about to do over the next couple of years in most of the fragile and conflict affected countries. So, so that is really uh, quite a, a change compared to the past. Um, and we should find a moment to, um, to uh, share some of that uh, with you. Um, there was a question as well about mediation and, and how are you going to follow up on your mediation concept? As you know, we had at the end of last year, a new mediation concept was adopted by Council Conclusions. How are you going to implement that now? Well, there will be a big launch event um, by the end of February on the so-called guidance note. So we have taken that new EU concept of mediation, which, which formulates as, as a concept what it is that we want to do in terms of mediation. We've taken all the critical elements out of that and translated that into a guidance note. And that is a guidance note for our heads of delegations EUSRs, etc., and hopefully an inspiration for others, um, where we set out how we approach, I don't know, women, peace and security and mediation, climate change and mediation, the whole digital development and mediation. So all of that is, is, is forthcoming, and I hope we can share that with you soon and have an engagement on, on how to take that forward. Uh, let me end on that positive note. Back to you, Richard. Rene, thank you so much. Uh, Olia, I, I, I'm going to turn to you. There aren't specific questions for you, but would you like to reflect on anything else? We, 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 have, we still have a question uh, that, that I can come to or, or that you can talk to about how we, how crisis group, uh, a really important question, how crisis group uh, mainstreams our gender analysis, how we incorporate uh, gender perspectives in, in our work. So you, you could talk about that one or, or anything else that you would like to, to reflect on at the end. Sure, um, and I'll try to do all of that quickly. Um, so crisis group does um, come at our analysis from the standpoint that uh, gender matters. We look uh, specifically both at how narratives of um, masculinity, for instance, can affect conflict uh, and how they can affect conflict resolution. Um, understanding that doesn't necessarily solve your conflict, right? I can tell you that narratives of toxic, toxic narratives of masculinity helped cause a war, but I can't magically solve it in order to end that war, right? Um, so it is much, it does end up being much more of an understanding what's possible in resolution and prevention um, tool. We 
also do look at how conflicts affect people of different genders differently. And I think it is notable, and I, I recall the question um, that was asked, that this doesn't always come through in the conversations that we then have, right? Because we come back to these discussions of who can do what, um, how you can help, uh, how you can help prevent, how you can help mitigate. And a lot of the people at these, um, the tables for these discussions are going to be men. Um, and I think that is a factor that you need to consider and you need to also integrate into your work, whether you are thinking through ways to solve these problems or um, developing your own policies and solutions. I mean, I can say talking about Ukraine, talking about Karabakh, talking about any of the conflicts in uh, the region that I cover, gender is very important and the impacts of these conflicts are very gendered. Uh, for instance, in Karabakh, uh, most of the people killed were men. Uh, they were combatants and they were also mostly young men because they were conscripts. Most of the people displaced were women and, um, and, to, and to some extent children. Uh, that's important in how you respond, how you design humanitarian support, and how you think about uh, making peace in the future. The one other thing I would raise, um, and it does come back to COVID, because I think we're going to be thinking about the implications of this pandemic and perhaps future pandemics for a long time. Azerbaijan and Armenia estimate that between them, they lost something over 5,000 people uh, killed in the six weeks of war. Um, and that's probably about right. Uh, those are mostly combatants. Both countries estimate that between them, they lost about 6,000 people to COVID over the past year. Um, that's probably a stunning undercount. Uh, here in Belgium, where I live, we estimate over 20,000 people have died from COVID. So when we think about our work and our desire to end conflict and our desire to keep people from being killed in conflict, we need to think about other things that kill people. And the implications of this pandemic, I think, are just huge here. I also think it's going to be really important to look at how great power competition plays out in vaccine distribution. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of temptation both to use vaccine distribution for geostrategic aims and potentially um, there's a risk uh, that vaccine distribution might be blocked as a result of geostrategic conflict. And again, here we get to the question of who lives and who dies, which I think is very important for all of us. Oh yeah, thank you very much. Again, uh, very thoughtful and, and, and comprehensive. Comfort, uh, I'm going to leave you the, 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 the last word of our, of our panelists. I think you have a, an almost impossible task in that I'm going to ask you to, uh, uh, to answer the questions that have come up on Ethiopia. Um, so one was, uh, how should uh, Europe's position factor in the influence of, of, of other powers, in essence, that, that, that also uh, play a role in you know, this other global powers in particular? Uh, a word or two about the geopolitics of the crisis in Tigray. Um, there's a question on Mozambique. So maybe you could just take one moment just to, to, to talk about uh, what, we, what we're seeing happening in, in uh, the Cabo Delgado area with the insurgency there. And then if you have a moment at the end to reflect on the Central African Republic um, and uh, you know, obviously one of the other crises that really escalated towards the end of last year it's in our watch list. We haven't talked about it much today. So if you could just end with a, with a word on that too, that would be great. And I realize I'm being very greedy and asking you to do a lot in the uh, in, in, in a short period of time. Thank you. Said, you said four minutes, right, Richard? <laughs> um, you have a little bit, you have a little bit longer. You, you, have, uh, you have five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just to, I mean to, just to quickly sort of answer that sort of broader geopolitical questions and I'll tie them up together. I mean, it's, it's yes, it's always worth remembering that the crisis, um, the Tigray crisis, is taking place, um, you know, in a region that is all, all, also um, sort of an intense regional rivalry and great power of geopolitics. You know, with in, in intense um, you know, rivalry over oil reserves, you know, sea route competition, not just in relation to to China, but also um, Gulf rivalries, and also, I mean, I see one of your your, your questions was in relation to China. But it's also not just China, Europe, but it's also China, 
and 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 the US as well. So it's a it's a real contest um, for for building up um, alliances as well. And in that mix, Ethiopia is a, is a crucial actor in terms of Horn and Red Sea geopolitics as well. So I think you know there are three sort of three questions that have been asked here, and I'll, I'll leave aside the question of China, except to say that given China's own investment and the 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 the, the relationship in relation to debt, of course you know the way that relationship um, is unfolding. Um, with Ethiopia's interest in, I mean, Ethiopia has shown itself um, to be emboldened and independent and not necessarily hamstrung by the fact that it's got, you know, this, this great investment coming from China. It doesn't necessarily see that as, a, as binding its ability to independently pursue um, its own war in Eritrea. And in fact, Prime Minister Abiy is even more emboldened um, seeing himself as securing a military victory. So I think the question is less about who's aligned to China, but how international actors can coalesce together to influence Abiy as well. And none, none of the international actors today, whether it's China, the Gulf countries, or the Western countries, the EU are able to, to, to nudge Prime Minister Abiy on the side. And I would frame the question um, around about building international consensus to, to try and pressure um, Prime Minister Abiy. Two, I think tied to that is the question of, of Eritrea. And, and in fact, Richard, it's not, it's not even a question about Eritrea. There's one, one key actor in, in all of this um, is an ally to the three countries, that's the UAE. The UAE influential in Eritrea, in Ethiopia, and in, and in Sudan. All those three countries now face tensions both within themselves, between themselves, and the linchpin in all of this story is the UAE. So you've got an Eritrea where there's increasing evidence um, coming from the US, coming from um, eyewitnesses on the ground, um, is increasingly engaged, piling up evidence of its own involvement in the country. On the other side, you've got tensions escalating, border tensions with, with Khartoum and, and, and Addis playing out. And then the other layer then is tensions uh, um, between um, Sudan and Egypt um, in relation to, to the GERD. And the question is how you begin to untangle and unpack all these um, all these tricky geopolitic, geopolitical dynamics to, to focus on the war in, on, in Tigray, to ensure that we don't see an unraveling of the crisis in Sudan, to ensure that we don't see an escalation of border tensions between um, Sudan and, and, and Ethiopia, and to al also ensure that Eritrea doesn't feel further emboldened by the crisis um, in, in Ethiopia. What we're seeing today, um, Richard, um, is a strong stand standoff that is occurring between Ethiopia and, and Sudan. Um, it's not quite clear um, who is going to be able to pull both forces back. One of the recommendations we make is that they take their, their border tensions to the AU um, Borders um, Boundary Commission um, to, to try and negotiate the tensions to tensions there as well. Um, moving swiftly um, to, to the question of Mozambique, um, the fact that we don't put Mozambique on any of our list, lists is not because we don't think it's important. I mean, in keeping with Crisis Group's own methodology, um, it's important for us to have, to have done the groundwork, to have spoken to all the key actors um, before we place uh, Mozambique on the country. Um, in fact, it could have, and you and I debated whether to put Mozambique on the list, and we felt that it was a little bit premature um, to put it on but we do recognize um, and we are engaging with Mozambique within the context of our global work on jihadi and modern day conflict. I think you know, crucial thing for us is that there are a number of lessons from the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin, uh, particularly the consequences of how disproportionate emphasis on military solutions themselves go hand in hand in worsening the situation on the ground. And one of the big, one of the core recommendations to the Mozambique government is how to alter this reliance on a military response and try to seek um, more local political solutions, working for reconciliation with, with the different um, groupings and the insurgency and to make sure that the insurgency doesn't mushroom um, to become sort of a 10 year crisis that like we've seen in the Lake Chad Basin or, or like we're seeing um, also in, 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 the, in the Sahel. The one thing that I do know, Richard, because your, your, your Q and A um, person who asked the question asked about the EU's role um, under its six months pres presidency, we know that P Portugal um, is, is trying to 
put on the table concrete options in which to deal with Mozambique. The foreign minister is supposed to be going down there um, to, to Mozambique. So I think we'll be looking out to see what recommendations um, Brussels will shape. But I think the key issue for, for us, lessons learned from the Sahel and Lake Chad Basin is to ensure that we don't see um, a further use of, overuse of military force, that we don't see intercommunal violence, that we don't see um, a disproportionate use of force and that there's real great, greater emphasis on political dialogue. Um, let me end by focusing on CAR and it's, you know, in a, in a sense, um, we've almost done what we've always wanted to avoid on CAR, which is to leave it right at the end <laughs> and forget about it. It's, it is a forgotten conflict. And the fact that it's back on the table, um, it is also, it's also very, very worrying. Um, just in a nutshell, um, Richard, you know, it's, we've seen a significant setback in the Central African Republic um, with opposition deeply unhappy, um, with no, but with no ability to change the dynamics on the ground. The government less likely to give concessions to the opposition. Um, it's difficult um, to defeat the rebels. Um, the government is relying and depending on regional allies, plus um, um, Russian forces, plus the UN to help um, stop the rebels from, from making any further inroads um, in, into, into Bangui. Uh, but also the re rebellion is internally divided. Today, the, the um, Tudere um, um, seems safe. The government seems safe um, because the rebels can't take Bangui and, and the rebels themselves can't keep hold of the key areas that they have. But getting the government and the opposition and the armed groups back to negotiations is essential, but with fighting continuing, it's hard to see how that's going to happen. I think before we can even begin to contemplate how to resurrect the 2019 peace agreement, several steps need to be taken um, beforehand. Um, first, um, and I think the EU is in a strong position to persuade both sides to cool down the temperature and, and to begin to sort of pull back from the fighting. I think second, um, it, the EU is also in a strong position to get the opposition groups also to condemn the actions that took place um, before December, the, the elections. There, there's now clear evidence that there was, a, there was an attempt to run on Bangui and, and, and to prevent those elections from, from taking place. And also I think there has to be pressure on the government to pull back um, its use of security forces and pro-government militias um, into the country. All these are critical steps before we can begin to talk about how we can resurrect um, the, the 2019 election. So a lot of work um, to be done. I think one of the, the, the our forecasts for 2019, for 2021, Richard, is that we're, we're likely to see protracted conflict um, unfold in the, CIA, in the CAR if we can't pull back the government forces and the rebels um, from, from the further fight in Bangui and other, other parts of the country. Thank you. Comfort, thank you very much. That was brilliant, as uh, as as always. And uh, you know, although we've left Central African Republic till the end, this time obviously we're we're watching very carefully. The the, the team in, in Central Africa is really uh, engaged on that on that conflict. Um, let me uh, end by uh, just making a very quick comment to something that uh, Mark said, which I think is is really important. That that part of our our partnership and our collaboration with the with the European Union is, of course, about about early warning. It's about recognizing signs of problems early, mobilizing early action, and trying to steer off uh, uh, potential causes of violence, address potential causes of violence, avert, avert crises. And a lot of this watch list work is aimed towards that. We also do a lot of other engagement. Uh, we, we, we obviously publish Crisis Watch, our, our monthly bulletin. We engage on the basis of that in, in horizon scanning with the EU institutions, which we enormously um, enormously value. So just to reiterate what, what Mark said, uh, uh, you know, the, the importance of, of early warning, it's, it's really a, a big, big part of our, of our partnership with the European institutions. Let me uh, end by wishing everybody a, a, a good evening if you're in Brussels, a, a good rest of the day if you're, if you're, uh, if you're in the US. Um, and thank you very, very much to, to Mark and to Rene that have joined us from the, the institutions. Thank you also to my colleagues, Comfort, uh, Olya, Ivan, Joost, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for, for, for joining us. Bye-bye.